All right, welcome to this afternoon's uh, work session. We, first order of business is if any commissioner wants to talk about any of the preliminary items for the 215-22 BOC meeting. Hearing none, we will go to our work, work, first work uh, session item is the ATL transit presentation. Good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chair, Board of Commissioners. Um, we're very fortunate enough to have with us um, some of the leadership from ATL Transit Link. Um, part of this was initiated by a conversation with Commissioner Franklin about different um, tools that we can put in our toolbox as it pertains to um, how we can manage our transit um, planning part of Clayton County. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with, with Kane and John in a preliminary meeting. Um, they came to the table with a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge. So I call before you uh, Mr. Kane Williamson, who's the Chief Planning Officer for the ATL um, Link Authority, and John Revanelli, who's the Transit Funding Director, and they'll give you an overview of the different resources they have. Gentlemen. Thank you, sir. John, how are you doing, sir? It's good to see you as always. How you doing? Um, thank you, Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity to be here, Madam Vice Chair. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, we're going to do our best to answer all of your questions today because I've noticed that punishment for poor performance is broken feet um, here in Clayton <laughs> exactly. County. Exactly. And so uh, hopefully we will be successful and not leave here injured. Um, so again, we thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Kane Williamson. I'm the Chief Planning Officer for the ATL. Um, and John Ravenel is our transit funding director. I, I'm going to intro the presentation. Uh, the majority of it is going to be uh, John talking about funding <coughs> opportunities. Um, and then we would be glad to have any kind of discussion or answer any kind of questions that you all may have for us um, from any perspective that you, that you uh, might have come up. So just a little bit about who the ATL is, what the ATL is. We are a regional planning and funding authority, as it says on the screen. Um, I would add to that we're also an operational authority. We do operate the express bus system um, in the region, so we probably need to update this slide. Um, but in addition to, uh, to the planning and funding, we do operate the, the, um, the express bus system. We provide, and the intent is for us to develop a seamless approach to transit across the entirety um, of the metropolitan region. You can see the map on the screen there. Our board of directors is composed of 10 um, district folks who were elected by a caucus of the state legislators and locally elected officials in each of those districts, um, as well as we have um, the chair of our board is appointed by the governor. We have two appointees from the speaker and two appointees from the lieutenant governor. And then the commissioner of the state DOT is an ex officio non-voting member of the board. So that brings our board to a total of 16 members, the preponderance of which um, are elected by, uh, or appointed, I guess, by a caucus of elected officials. Um, and you can see we've listed our key functions here across the bottom of the screen, which is about coordination of our partners, um, delivering innovation around transit, strengthening the system, um, advancing transit investments, uh, and then enhancing the customer experience. Um, all of these things we believe conspire to push the region forward in a cohesive way. Um, in the legislation that created us, we were tasked with producing three primary documents from a regional perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first of which is an annual report and audit. So every year we produce a report and audit. Audit is a very strong word. It's more of a report, um, but audit is the language that was used in the legislation. Um, it's a report basically on the performance of the region's transit system. So we collect data um, uh, every fiscal year and produce this report by December of every calendar year uh, to share with the legislature, the OPB, and the governor's office that just basically talks about significant events over the past year in the life of the region's transit system, as well as um, operational statistics, funding statistics, and that sort of stuff associated with each of the systems. Um, it is. I mean, I've been doing transit in this region for about 20 years, and it is uh, the most comprehensive set of data in one place about the region's transit system than I think we've ever had. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at it if you haven't had a chance to. It's on our website, um, and if uh, you have any trouble, just let us know. We'd be glad to send mm -hmm. you a copy. There is an executive summary, so you don't have to read multiple hundreds of pages. Uh, you can get the gist of it pretty quickly. 
Um, we also are required to develop the ATL regional transit plan. So uh, we, the legislation requires the development of a regional transit plan and then an annual review and update as necessary of that plan. We have adopted two plans so far. Um, they've been roughly on annual cycles. We expect that our board will adopt a third version of that plan in this August. Um, this plan that we're cu currently updating is um, a little bit different than the previous two plans. The previous two plans really function as a, um, I guess, a, a, a data gathering effort around all of the projects, the transit projects that the, were being contemplated by all the transit operators and local governments, CIDs in the region. Um, this plan is a little more of a uh, effort at a strategic planning document. So we will be looking at not only those those that list of projects that each of the each of our partners has for what they would like to pursue, but also how that stitches together in a regional system, such that we don't end up with a patchwork of systems and instead in, or patchwork of projects and instead end up with something that is cohesive, logical, and improves mobility across the entirety of the region. Uh, I'm excited for this. Um, it has taken us about or will have taken us about 18 months or so to produce this by the time we get to the adoption. Um, Whereas previously we were taking probably eight to nine months to do a plan. This, so this is a, a deep, much deeper dive into an understanding of the region, the region's transit needs, the travel markets and that sort of stuff. So um, I will uh, encourage you all to take a look at that once we've adopted it as well. And then the third uh, statutory required document is, the, is a priority investment list. It is essentially a list of the region's priority transit projects that is due to the governor's office, OPB, and the state legislature by September 1 of every year, um, which is, it, the list is meant to represent the highest priority, most readily deliverable projects out of that regional transit plan that I talked about. Um, and the point of that is for the legislature and the governor's office to consider those projects for um, bond dollars and or uh, transit trust fund dollars. So you all may know that the transit trust fund is capitalized with a fee on um, ride share providers. So Uber, Lyft, taxis and limousines all pay a 50 cent per ride fee. That goes to capitalize a transit trust fund in the state and that transit trust fund is used um, to, to support transit projects across the state. So those are the three documents that we produce on a regular basis, two of which are annual. The ARTP, the transit plan, is probably going to be something more like biennial going forward. Um, as I mentioned, we also are the provider of the express bus system in the region. You all may remember this as Greta Express Bus. Um, it is now ATL Express Bus. The legislation that created has transferred responsibility and ownership of this system to us. Um, so just a few stats you see on the screen there. We have 27 routes that are operating, 27 park and ride lots in 12 counties. We actually attract ridership from roughly twice, I would say, the number of counties, um, but we only provide service in those 12 counties. Uh, in Clayton County, we have four park and ride lots, and we have five express bus routes that um, serve the county. Uh, I think the only other county with that many park and ride lots is Gwinnett, um, so you're doing pretty well um, by those standards. Also, our South Operations Facility is here in Clayton County, um, which will uh, be important uh, on this next slide. So just to, to sort of put Clayton uh, in that context, right, um, you have two board members, two ATL board members that represent portions of Clayton County, um, Districts 9 and Districts 10. Howard Mosby uh, represents sort of the northeastern portion of Clayton and your own um, Commissioner Franklin represents sort of the south and western portion of the county. Um, <clears throat> and then the two transit providers are, are us, ATL Express and MARTA, uh, obviously are your two transit service providers. And just a couple of highlights of um, what we're doing, what MARTA is doing with regard to Clayton uh, there on the screen, you can see that, um, like I said, our, uh, our maintenance facility is, is here. MARTA is developing a maintenance facility here in the county. Um, the, the BRT that MARTA is considering now or is in development now is also uh, relates to the county. Um, there is another uh, set of projects on our um, priority investment list, which you'll see John talk about a little bit later, related to the Aerotropolis um, and the airport areas. Um, so the corporate circulator, corporate crescent circulator, is is um, is specific to, to Clayton as well. 
And then we're in the process of deploying a set of electric coaches. Um, this is, these will be the first coaches in the country that have passed all the requisite federal testing to be road ready. <clears throat> um, I think we're getting six of those vehicles, is that right? So six, of, we're implementing six of those vehicles and they will be coming out of the South Operations Facility here in Clayton County. So um, Clayton is sort of serving as our test bed for this innovative approach to the delivery of um, electric vehicles um, through the uh, express bus system. So I, that's sort of my introduction. I'm gonna stop talking now and, and ask John to come up and talk to you uh, about a number of funding um, issues the first of which would be the bipartisan infrastructure bill that um, the feds just adopted. Thank you, Kane, and good evening. Uh, again, my name is John Ravnell. I'm the transit funding director for the ATL. And really, uh, uh, after conversations, um, we wanted to, to, um, to provide an overview of uh, an update on the bipartisan infrastructure bill or infrastructure investment and job, jobs act that was recently passed. And so uh, this was a pretty historic bill that passed Congress uh, and was signed by the, uh, President Biden. It reauthorizes the surface transportation programs through federal fiscal year 26 and authorizes a total of $550 billion in new spending across all the surface transportation programs, roads, ports, uh, bridges, waterways, et cetera, as well as public transportation over the next five years. Um, specific to transit, we're looking at $106.9 billion uh, in funding over that period. And really the most important part is this is not just the formula funds that uh, uh, transit providers in the region get on a regular basis, but there's a significant increase in the amount of discretionary or competitive funds that are on the table uh, that are uh, able to be competed for at the national level to pull down back into the Atlanta region, into the state of Georgia. Um, and really what we're seeing from the IIJ is that it's going to take a lot of non-federal matching funds to be able to attract those federal dollars into our region. For transit specifically, we're looking at a 63% increase in funding over the FAST Act, which was the prior surface transportation bill, uh, or $41.1 billion. Um, and we're looking at an Atlanta urbanized area, which is the 23 county uh, UZA would be the technical acronym, but essentially the 23 county urbanized area in terms of population, population density in the metro region, region is looking at a 27% increase in formula funding. Um, the CIG expansion program, that is the major transit expansion program that the uh, federal government provides, uh, is looking at a $3 billion increase on an annual basis. That's pretty significant. That's over $1.6 in funding that was previously provided on an annual basis. I do have an asterisk there, though, because that $3 billion is subject to the annual appropriations pro process in D.C. And so, obviously, uh, as political winds change, that will be subject to the appropriations process that may have some impact. It's not uh, fully dedicated through the, throughout the life of the bill. Um, also important with the CIG program is that MARTA recently submitted uh, the Clayton County Riverdale BRT project into the capital investment grants pipeline. This is a significant milestone. Uh, we would like to uh, congratulate our partners at MARTA for this because uh, it's been quite a while since the Atlanta region has had a project enter the CIG pipeline. You're talking about the North Springs extension in the early 2000s. And so we really think the, the Clayton County BRT project is a really important project for the region and the metro Atlanta area and are really excited for it to be evaluated for funding through the CIG program. Um, and then additionally, in terms of discretionary funding, there's a lot of funding for zero emission uh, battery electric buses. Um, there is some funding still available targeting CNG buses, but the, the big focus at the federal level is shifting things to electric buses primarily. And then finally, um, not just programs through the Federal Transit Administration, there's also a broadening of eligibility for transit at the federal level through what's called the RAISE program, formerly BUILD and TIGER. Uh, as well as a new program called the Carbon Reduction Program, which can help support and fund uh, transit-related investments. So how can we maximize uh, these federal dollars that are available in the metro Atlanta region? 
really what we've seen is that there's some challenges to pulling down these dollars. Uh, the, the majority of which are that there's a quick turnaround time in how quickly applications have to be submitted. You're looking at 30 to 60 days um, and it really uh, requires project sponsors to know exactly who's applying, what they're applying for, and having the matching funds in hand. Now, uh, transit providers like MARTA have been very successful at this because they have that directly generated sales tax of which Clayton County contributes. In fact, MARTA recently received a uh, FTA award for the bus maintenance facility down in Clayton, which was significant. For other counties, uh, such as a Cobb or a Gwinnett, it's a little bit more difficult to carve out those matching funds. Um, and so what we are at the ATL are looking to do is to support both our partners at MARTA as well as our partners at the counties is look at ways to leverage state funding as the match to then go ahead and target these federal discretionary dollars to pull down. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, uh, from a local perspective, there's three primary options uh, to provide local funding uh, through referenda. Um, the first of which is a transportation special local option sales tax. That's the five-year TSPLOS option. Um, a lot of counties utilize this for a combination of road and bridge projects, pedestrian, bike ped, trails, as well as uh, public transportation in some instances. Uh, for a certain subset of counties in the 13-county uh, region, there's the MARTA referendum, of which Clayton County uh, passed in 2014. Uh, there is the ability for Cobb and Gwinnett to go that route as well, with Fulton, DeKalb, and City of Atlanta already having done so, in addition to Clayton. And then lastly, there's a uh, new referendum that was created with the authorizing legislation of the ATL, the House Bill 930 referendum, or what we affectionately call the transit spost. Um, that provides opportunities of up to 1% in funding and increments of 0.05%, uh, and it can be approved for up to 30 years. So this is another tool in the toolbox if there's a, a desire for increased investment, even by some of those counties in the MARTA jurisdiction to go after if they so choose. But really, um, based on this is a graphic from our annual report and audit, um, based on our analysis of the revenue sources in the metro Atlanta region, the, the biggest gap right now is state investment. Um, you can see that the state investment is highlighted in the second column of pie charts in red. Um, and when you compare it to the first column of pie charts, uh, in red, uh, you are looking at 22% contributions for operating revenues and 17% for capital revenues. And so when we look at that and took a step back, uh, coupled with the information coming on the next slide, we thought how can we increase not only the pie piece in red, but also the pie piece in that orange, right, the federal pie piece. Um, because we think there's an opportunity to leverage the state funds, again, to be more attractive for federal funds. Um, so an analysis that we performed on uh, FAST Act funding, which was the previous Surface Transportation Authorization Bill, uh, and discretionary transit funding specific, uh, I want to say that again, discretionary transit funding specifically, uh, this does not include roads and bridges, GDOT does a, a fantastic job as well as the local governments of pulling down discretionary funding for roads. Um, but for transit specifically, what we found is that Georgia is currently underperforming where it is in population as well as where it pulls down in formula funds for transit. Um, and it's also underperforming some key uh, peer states, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, states of similar populations and demo uh, demographics as well as uh, political demographics. Um, and so we think there's an opportunity to increase that discretionary funding rank um, from 35th to something more akin to uh, our state population, which is 8th, or our formula fund, pop uh, formula fund level, which is 12th. And so we think there's, there's an opportunity here to close that discrepancy. So how can we leverage the work we do at the ATL in coordination with our partners uh, at MARTA as well as the rest of the region to better leverage both state funding and federal discretionary funding? So uh, Kane mentioned the priority investment list. It's a list we develop annually uh, to support uh, a, a, a list of projects for state investment, uh, again, submitted to the legislature and the governor's office. 
these projects need to meet the administrative requirements of the state bond uh, funding, which generally means that they need to be able to start spending down funds in a three to five year period. So they have to be fairly shovel ready projects. They have to be included in the most recently adopted regional transit plan uh, adopted by the ATL board. And then they have to perform well in uh, that plan's performance evaluation. So as we adopt all these as we adopt a plan, um, we put each of the projects through a robust evaluation to determine how well do we think this project will perform once it's delivered. And so we try to ensure that the, the cream rises to the crop, or excuse me, the cream rises to the top, and that those are the projects that start to move forward sooner rather than later. And then finally, we also want to ensure that the projects reflect the local, the regional, state, as well as federal priorities, ensuring that uh, how we're evaluating projects here in the metro Atlanta region is also going to be similar to how they're going to be evaluated when they're <coughs> looked at for federal discretionary funding. And what we found is that there's a lot of overlap between the criteria that we use in our regional transit plan as well as the criteria that the um, Federal Transit Administration and USDOT is using to evaluate projects for federal discretionary awards. This uh, list of 17 projects was the one that was adopted by our board uh, this past uh, August in 2021. Um, of note, the Clayton County BRT project is on there. Um, and we, again, uh, strongly support that project. And there's several others on here that were submitted to the legislature for consideration of funding through both the ride share fees as well as the general obligation bond funding. So in terms of opportunities to maximize transit investments, oops, sorry, uh, a little quick with the clicker. Um, we look at our priority investment list as identifying those higher performing projects. And then we are then looking to work with the state legislature and the governor's office to take ride share fee fun funding and potential bond funding to leverage that as the matching funds for our partners to then go after federal discretionary funding. So what this would look like is, for example, if uh, for one of the priority projects, um, if there was six million in matching funds required, the, the goal would be for rideshare fee funds to provide that six million in match to then allow us to be proactive in lining up these federal discretionary applications rather than reactive so that we can start to um, be more strategic in how we uh, take down some of this uh, historic levels of discretionary funding. Because uh, we think that from a state perspective, the message of for every $1 in state funding, we could leverage $4 in federal funding that we're currently not leveraging is a pretty strong one. It's pretty powerful to say if, if the state puts in one and we bring in four federal, that's five new dollars to transit investment which we think is uh, pretty impressive and we'll show in a, in a few slides um, why that matters. And then ultimately the goal is to deliver these high performing projects in the near term. Um, and so that's, that's really what we're hoping to do. Um, in terms of opportunities for Clayton to leverage uh, the IIJA federal funding, um, from our perspective, it's really important for the county to I clearly identify its top transit priorities and work with its transit providers, both MARTA as well as Express, to articulate those and communicate those with one voice so that it's very clear to us as the practitioners which direction we should be going from an Express perspective in terms of serving the county. Um, as well as MARTA in, in serving the county with its local bus as well as capital expansion program. Additionally, uh, there's significant opportunities for the county to coordinate with the regional commission as well as the state DOT to leverage and identify projects through the RAISE program, uh, formerly Tiger and Build, as well as this new carbon reduction program that it might like to see be used for transit. And then finally, um, this is probably one of the most important points, is that the county has the ability to leverage and ensure that land use aspects of the county are transit supportive and transit oriented. Um, MARTA recently received a discretionary grant for that Clayton BRT project to look at transit oriented development along that corridor. Uh, transit is only as good as the land use that is supporting it. Um, and that is a really critical element that I cannot highlight enough that without supportive land use, 
the transit won't be effective. And, and, and so as the county moves forward, that is a really strong way in which it can support any transit expansion or development moving forward. And then finally, why does this new level of funding matter? Um, and really, from our perspective, it's because there's a significant opportunity to add jobs, both within the county and in the region. For every one billion in new federal dollar, uh, one billion in new federal investment that we see in this uh, region, we can expect to see 50,000 jobs created. Wow. And additionally, for every one dollar in new state and federal investment in transit, five new dollars are created in terms of the regional product. And so transit really has a significant ability to move the needle in terms of economic development. Uh, and it's why we think increasing not only the state pot, but leveraging that state pot to increase the entire pie through the federal discretionary funds is really a strategy we want to take advantage of as a region. And so with that, um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this evening and happy to answer any questions with Kane. Thank you for both for the presentation. A lot of insightful information. Uh, is there any uh, questions by board members? Mm. Commissioner Hambrick, you have a question? Yes. Uh, the first one is of the $41 billion that was mentioned that coming from the federal, is that coming from uh, will that be distributed from you all or from MARTA, or is, is that what MARTA has put in for? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, it'll be a, a combination. So there's a formula component, which is distributed based on population and operating statistics, and ATL is the designated recipient for the Atlanta region, distributes that funding on a formula basis. So MARTA will receive that formula funds from the ATL, um, and then be able to utilize that to support the services in Clayton County. There's another significant component to that, which is uh, competitive, that MARTA can then submit directly for uh, and compete with other projects nationally for that funding. Um, so it's a combination of the two. Okay, and MARTA will have, I guess, since we are a part of that, we would uh, be included? Y it should be? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. In fact, uh, I'd say that the, the, the biggest expansion program um, is, is seeing a Clayton project, which is the first time we've seen a project of that type mm -hmm. to that major program uh, since the early 2000s. And so that's a pretty significant milestone and I think pretty exciting for the county to, to be the first, uh, first jurisdiction that MARTA submitted that, uh, a project into that program for. Okay, so is that the BRT? Yes, ma'am. I, I, if I could just add to what John said, going back. Please speak in the mic, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. If I could just add into what John said, going back to this slide that he pulled up, to partially, I think, uh, in answer to your question, Commissioner Hamrick, is um, Clayton identifying its priorities and communicating those to MARTA so that when those discretionary funding opportunities come up, MARTA is clearly aware of what the county's goals are. Um, and can think about how the discretionary funding opportunities that are before them at the federal level can help you meet those goals through their service provision. Yeah, because I've been thinking that was a different part of money. Because Maude has been talking about the BRT for a long time, before even the infrastructure bill was passed and all. Well, they ha I mean, you, they, have, they have revenue that's coming from your sales tax, which they're going to use to support that BRT. But there is also the federal discretionary pot of money, the CIG program, the capital investment grant program that FTA runs that will complement the amount of money that Clayton is putting into the project from a local from a local level. Okay, one of your slides had uh, the different states mm -hmm. and it had um, Georgia mm -hmm. at, well, lower end, but not the very bottom because I think Ohio had, uh, yes, that, that's it. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking here and I'm looking at uh, South Carolina <coughs> with that amount of money and then I'm looking at Georgia and I'm looking at the numbers, how we rank. Okay, on the state population, okay, discretionary. F <laughs> okay, so uh, what puts us so much lower than where they are? Great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I, 
in our work, what we've found is that um, the biggest obstacle is having those matching funds secured on the, uh, es essentially for every grant opportunity with the federal government, the, the locals or the state has to provide matching dollars to attract those federal dollars. The feds won't pay for 100% of a project, and usually it's an 80% federal, 20% local match. Um, and so what we struggle with often in the metro Atlanta region is that the 20% match is hard to identify. Um, MARTA generally does not struggle with this. MARTA has performed really well and is a, a reason why we've pulled down 95 million of that. Express has been successful as well. Um, but there's, there's really a, an opportunity for us to even get better at this as we move forward. And we think the state providing that 20% to then go after that 80% uh, is really an opportunity for us as we move forward. So whose responsibility is that? Is that you all ATL or is that our General Assembly? or? Uh, so the General Assembly would appropriate <laughs> the uh, ride share fee funding for transit. Um, and it's uh, one of the ATL's roles is to identify projects to submit to the legislature as well as the governor's office to consider uh, for the usage of those ride share fees as well as state uh, bond funds. And so it's, it's a, a combination uh, of the two and it's, it's something that we're working on actively to try and uh, support our partners as well as work with our partners to identify those high performing projects to then uh, use those state funds to then attract the federal funds. So could, could, could I add to that also that es essentially up until recently, MARTA has been the only entity in the region mm -hmm. who has had a dedicated <coughs> source of money for transit. So we've had a number of transit operations in the region, Cobb, Gwinnett, MARTA, Express, but each of all those systems but MARTA has had to go to the general fund of whatever its governing body is on an annual basis to be awarded money for anything. But MARTA has a dedicated source of funding. I mean, they have the, the penny sales tax in all of their jurisdictions is coming to them on an annual basis. So they are, it's easier for them to know how much money they have annually for the purpose, whatever purposes they, they need to allocate it to and be prepared for these discretionary grant opportunities that are coming out of the FTA. So now we have a new dedicated fund source of funding at the state level, the transit ride, sh ride share dollars, um, which John is referencing. And what we are trying to sort of do with those dollars is to begin to get into that same sort of cycle, right? So we are being proactive uh, with those dollars as related to federal discretionary dollars in the same way that MARTA has been um, over its history. But yet you all are over MARTA. Well, we, we work we work with MARTA. Mm -hmm. um, um, we you have, all decide. We have, you all get, the, I guess, sounds like you all get the money, and then you distribute, you know, between MARTA and uh, somebody else. For, for some portion of those dollars, that's mm -hmm. true. So, th so the, when the federal dollars come to this, come to us, it comes in two ways. There's a formula distribution that FTA distributes on a very, on a, relatively complex formula across the country. And those dollars come to urbanized areas, it's like metropolitan regions. Um, and when those dollars come to this region, the ATL has responsibility for sort of acting as the accountant of those dollars at a regional scale and distributing them at a sub-regional scale. So, those, so that portion of the money would flow through us to MARTA. Kane, I think it's important, if I may add real quick, sorry about my voice, for the commissioner to understand that the distribution on behalf of the ATL is what's been submitted to the ATL, as you were just stating within our call for projects, that we're not just choosing it out of the air. Can you connect that for us, please? Right, absolutely. So those, so that those federal dollars, those, those federal formula dollars, when they come to us, are then sub-allocated, currently sub-allocated on a formulaic basis. So we, so ATL just basically runs a formula on the pot of dollars that come to us, and we tell MARTA how much money they have. Right. And then Marta okay. so spends that money accordingly. If, if Clayton County gets any money, it ha does it have to go through Marta, or can we submit a request to you all? That's a great point. Directly. It's a great question. Great question. So, <laughs> um, the way the Federal Transit Administration funding works is that to access those dollars, you have to be what's called a direct recipient, and to become that, there's a significant administrative hurdle. 
uh, to do so, um, and a lot of uh, oversight uh, and compliance that you'd have to work with the Federal Transit Administration on. MARTA, uh, for all intents and purposes of Clayton County, is that direct, uh, direct recipient. And so for any of the formula funds that uh, come in for Clayton County, uh, they are distributed to MARTA directly for use uh, in support of the MARTA system. Okay, well I saw something on here that had Cobb and Gwinnett. Cobb and, and Gwinnett. And they are not a part of MARTA, so how does, how does that work? How do they get C to get whatever? Um, Cobb and Gwinnett operate their own transit services. So it would be as if uh, there's a okay. department in your ca county budget called public transportation. Mm -hmm. And you all would have to make a decision uh, on an annual basis how much to appropriate out of your county budget. Um, that is how those transit operators operate. So generally the formulaic funds go directly to the county who are direct recipients themselves. And that's been a long standing uh, arrangement for many years now. Um, Clayton County ha has never been a direct recipient. It's always worked through uh, what I believe was the original CTRAN uh, system agreement, which uh, had yeah. some coordination with Greta, as well as now MARTA with the 2014 vote. Um, and the reason why you saw Cobb and Gwinnett on there is Cobb and Gwinnett have the ability to do a referendum vote like Clayton did in 2014 to join MARTA. And so that was that uh, reference there. Okay. I, I, I want to say something to you all about that, too. I read something today about what Atlanta is doing because they were promised a rail, and <coughs> we, had, we had discussed that. But last thing, um, Aerotropolis. Um, are you all, uh, do they work with you all, or are they a part of uh, your plan or whatever? Because I've gotten a presentation that included some of what you all are saying about the electric cars and some other means of transportation. Uh, yes, ma'am. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. The, so the Aerotropolis, um, we would consider the Aerotropolis a, a constituent, much like we would consider Clayton and MARTA constituents of the processes that we run. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, th you heard me mention the the regional transit plan earlier that we we produce. Um, the CID there would be able to submit projects to that plan for consideration the same way MARTA would be basically. But I, I would say the Aerotropolis is, um, works with us and with MARTA, um, MARTA being their primary service provider as well. Much like Clayton County, Marta is your primary service provider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Questions. Well, first of all, okay. First of all, I say thank y'all for being here. Love the mask. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a privilege and honor to work with um, an amazing staff. Let me tell you, Jonathan Ravenal. I think that he is a computer genius. He knows how to find those dollars in Kane. <laughs> I tell you, you, along with the work that you're doing in, in, in this in space, is absolutely amazing. And I'm glad to know that you know Clayton County and you've been there through the ARC and working with Clayton. But what I want to go back to real quick is one thing and specifically that I want you to hone in on. In terms of the Express, ATL Express operating out of the county, do you happen to have the information of the median income of um, those individuals that generally ride Express? I, I don't have it offhand. We, we, we do have that information, and I'd be glad to, to that would send be it great. to you all. Yeah. I think it's important for us to know as a community because too often we, we think of transit one way but not really thinking of it in a comprehensive manner for okay. mobility. Yes. And for you all to have invested um, so much with the South Ops and then the four um, the uh, four locations is really huge is letting us know that we've got folks that are on the generally higher income earners that are traveling into Atlanta on a daily basis. The other thing I want to look at here is you were talking about land use and making sure that we're centering our transit oriented developments around that and you did an excellent job but I want to just have you reiterate that one more time and kind of give us an example. Give the board an example of what you're talking about. Like, because we're going to have a presentation from Shannon James in a minute about Aerotropolis and um, trying to get some LCI funding to come in to work on 1941. So I think that it would be a benefit for our board to really understand what does that land use really look like. You know, how can we make sure that we're being proactive in that space and not just doing a comprehensive plan because it's time to update it? And are we updating it on a regular basis to make sure that we are um, 
positioned so we can continue to pull down federal dollars as we develop out transit oriented developments yeah i i think that's a that's a very that's a great it's a great question and and it's the reason that we put the final point on that things clayton can do slide because it is an important point right mm -hmm. um in the state of georgia land use authority is reserved for local governments cities and mm -hmm. counties right and so to the extent that um to the extent that land use decisions land use planning land use zoning permitting um local design of a land uses uh would be consistent with transit uh it's going to be up to local governments you all cities and counties in in our cities in, in clayton county so it's really important from our perspective as you as you think about what your goals from a transit planning perspective are to also think about how your land use responsibilities dovetail with those uh with those goals as well as your economic development goals right and so how do all these things come together such that when you've uh, you and Marta have made the significant investment in the BRT route. Um, you are sort of shoveling or funneling development along that route in such a way that it takes that maximizes the ability, uh, the use of that uh, of that route, and maximizes the uh, the economic development potential of that transit investment. Um, it it's transit oriented development, like the commissioner mentioned, is sort of is basically what that is called. Um, some people are now talking about um, transit community oriented mm -hmm. development so not just as specifically that specific transit stop but also a little more broadly how does how do you organize the community around a transit a transit stop or station um, so that's sort of the, the point that we were making um, it was exciting for us to see that marta won the grant to begin thinking about land use along that brt route from the federal government um, because land use is also one of the criteria that the federal government judges the viability of transit requests when they're made to them so that capital improvement grant program that CIG program that Marta has put for put the BRT um, project forward for consideration in um, land use supportive land use is one of the criteria that FTA will use to evaluate those projects and so creating this sort of virtuous cycle between your land use decisions and your transit decisions is where we sort of um, would hope to see you all be able to go so let me ask you this, Kane. So would you say that means that we've got to have a clear communication between our community development, MARTA, and even from, um, you know, at times with the ATL in order to ensure that we're positioning ourselves to leverage those dollars? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I do, do, very, very definitely. So a, a coordination between your community development group, your economic development group, um, you all and your cities, as well as MARTA, um, and even us with regard to our park and ride lots, um, which could serve as hubs eventually, right, would be, I think, very, very powerful. Um, and could really you could really begin to see um, sort of a, a fabric, a tapestry being developed um, that would move the, the county and, the, and its constituent awesome. cities forward. Thank you so much. You all have done an amazing job to bring us before us. The 50,000 jobs is beautiful. And I'm hoping that later, after this presentation, our board as the commissioner, as Madam Vice Chair on this board, stated she wanted to talk about a little further, that we can reorganize ourselves as a government to make sure we, we position ourselves so that we're not adding to be in the 35th. I think that people have to understand that the reason that we are the low, one of the lowest is because, as you stated, we did not have a match before. And not only that, that was that huge disconnect. So when you got places um, where they're competing against us and they've got all of that inner working, they've got those local governments, the local county government working lock and step from community development for comprehensive planning along with the transit and mobility providers and the direct recipients that's how they're winning every time you know uh, we just got to get that going you presented the formula for us today and i'm so happy that com the commissioners had questions we got to get it done so thank you so much thank you any other questions thank you both for being yes, here sir. thank you again appreciate, appreciate the information all right next we're going to hear from Human Resources 2021 Annual Stay Interview Survey. And Mr. Chair, one second. If I may ask Jonathan, I'll take my other hand, if you all could stay, if you can, a couple minutes longer, at least until we hear the presentation of Aerotropolis, okay? Yes. And I'll greet you before you leave. Ms. Ambles. 
Yes, sir, Chairman. Let me pull up the presentation. It should be, it's the one at the very top. Thank you. Well, good evening, Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioners, and good evening to our Clayton County citizens. Human Resources greatly appreciate the opportunity to share the findings from our 2021 annual stay interview. I say if it works for other companies, it should work for us too. However, being known as one of the best places to work for requires action. Our 2021 state interview is part of our ongoing employee relations efforts. Employee relations is an employer's effort to be a goodwill among its employees. To be known as a great place to work starts with the environment. It starts with an environment that fosters growth, an environment that is productive, healthy, team-oriented. I have worked with a lot of people over the course of my career, and I have had a lot of people tell me that they, they've actually left six figures jobs because of the environment. A state interview actually helps us to identify areas of excellence and areas that need to be improved. Most importantly, it represents our employees' voices. So what you're gonna hear from Human Resources today is not our perspective, but this represents the voices of our employees, our valued uh, employees. We're ramping up our efforts for employee relations, and Mr. Ryan Shaw, he is here, Human Resources Officer, Ryan leads this function for human resources, and he will be coming up to present the findings to you all. I want to share some of our current initiatives. We are engaging exit interviews. We are trying to capture information regarding why our employees are really leaving the county. That information can be powerful as we sit down to contemplate our uh, retention strategies. We can't formulate a good retention strategy if we don't know why the employees are leaving in the first place. Our annual state interviews, once again, helps us to identify areas of excellence and those areas that, needs, uh, that need improvement. The question here is, why do you stay with Clayton County? We appreciate it, but we want to know, we want to hear from you, why do you stay with Clayton County? We're also engaging a 120-day checkpoint. Uh, we have a um, survey going out tomorrow. This will target the employees who were hired in December. We're checking in with our new employees approximately 120 days after they have been hired. The purpose of that is we want to know, is the job what you expected it to be? Do you have the tools that you need to do your job? Have those important relationships been developed? That's the purpose of the 120-day checkpoint. Also, human resources, ongoing, enhanced communication. We absolutely love it when we can speak directly to our employees. So you'll see our Wellness Wednesdays that come out from Benefits Administration. And from time to time, you will see other communication going out to our employees just in an effort to stay in touch. Here are some initiatives that we want to review uh, for 2022. I'll start out by saying excellence cannot be created in a vacuum and human resources will be reaching out to other departments to help us with this. We'll be reaching out to finance, we'll be reaching out to communications, uh, economic devel development, and of course, Chuck Team Legal. What I would like to see happen is a Clayton County Employee Resource Center, and I know that's a heavy lift. But 10 years ago, it's been approximately 10 years ago, and this has stayed with me throughout the years, I had an employee to actually call me. I was not the HR director at the time, but she actually called me and said that she was about to be evicted. Now this was on a Tuesday in Clayton County, we get paid on Thursdays. I talked to my director at the time and there was no mechanism for her to get paid early and this person was evicted. 
I would like to see that resource center put in place so that, that employees, if they need financial assistance, perhaps something catastrophic has happened uh, in their environment and they may need just a little help, just a little boost. Also, I would like to see a, a more comprehensive Clayton County um, employee discount uh, program. The vision behind that it would be to partner with our local business owners uh, to establish an employee discount program for Clayton County employees. In my mind, this would spur local spending as well as providing discounts to our employees. I want to thank the board for approving uh, the wellness coordinator. In 2021, we did a lot of different things with our wellness program, a lot of different initiatives. You will see more of that now that we have a wellness, that we will have a wellness coordinator when we get that person on board. I wanted to share with the board an initiative that will be going out soon. It's the 2022 Walk into Wellness. This will be a shoe giveaway uh, to our employees to spur physical wellness. About six months ago, we did a uh, health and wellness survey, and we found that our employees highly value uh, physical wellness. Another significance for HR is that this, our wellness initiatives, they have been offered to all of the population. That's important to me because I've heard from our part-time employees and sometimes they don't feel as valued as our um, full-time employees in which they are. So the wellness initiatives, those have been offered to all employees full-time and part-time. Background, just a little background and methodology of how we carried out the uh, state interview. It was online, anonymous. We did incentivize the first 100 resp uh, respondents. It's interesting because almost half of the participants actually declined the incentive. The survey's overall goal, once again, is to improve our retention rate and to promote healthy work environments. Now, you may be saying, well, Pam, if it was, on, if it was anonymous, how did you all incentivize the uh, employees? I want to give uh, speak very briefly to that because HR integrity uh, is very important. If we tell an employee it's, it's anonymous, then that's exactly what it is. We ask for the employee numbers and they were isolated from the, rest of the, um, from the rest of the data, and that way we were able to go back and match the employee numbers to the name, and that is how we um, handed out the incentives. So I want our employees to understand if we say it's anonymous, it's truly anonymous. Our participation rate generally, traditionally, I should say, we don't have a lot of employees who participate, but we're seeing a change in a lot of employees are participating. This particular survey, we did have 557 employees to participate. If you notice, the title of the presentation is 557 voices. Uh, voices. So this is the, is, is the voices of our 557 employees who did participate. When you're surveying, ideally you want to get 30% of your population. I was just excited when we got to 500. I wanted fi at least 500. Another thing that's important about surveying is your representation of the population that you're surveying. And I am proud to say that we got 100% representation because each and every department participated in the survey. This is where I'm going to end it, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ryan Shaw. He's going to come up and talk to you about uh, some of the actual uh, results that we got in. Please keep in mind that this is 557 voices, Clayton County employees' voices. First, good evening to the Clayton County Board of Commissioners, Clayton County leaders, employees, and citizens. My name is Ryan Shaw. I am your Human Resources Officer, and I'm here to provide you the data obtained from the 2021 state surveys. First, going over the Human Resources Report Card to determine how our employees feel about their Human Resources Department. 
availability, responsiveness, knowledgeable, customer service, and trustworthy. These are core factors that must be in place for any human resources department to be effective. And apparently 95% of our employees feels that the human resources department is available. Can they get in contact with us? 95% of our employees feel that they are. We are. Responsiveness. How quickly do we get back in contact with our staff, with people? 92% of the participants feel that uh, they gave us a favorable rating. 96% of our participants feel that their HR department is knowledgeable about their jobs and how they serve as strategic partners with the various departments of Clayton County. Customer service. How cordial? How approachable are we? Well, 94% of our participants feel that we do provide outstanding customer service. Being trustworthy, which is very important. If a human resources department is not trustworthy, a lot of things would not get to us. 90% of our employees feel that the human resources department is trustworthy. Now, the departmental report cards. These percentages show how well our departments are meeting the expectations of our employees. 79% of our employees feels that our departments are providing them with a, a, a favorable work environment free of hostility. 89% feel that their departments are effective in the performance of their duties. 85% of the participants feel that their departments are efficient, equitable. How equitable are processes such as promotions? 83% of the participants feel that their departments are equitable. Very important, very good ratings for our departments. Now, these are non-specific. These are total of all of the particip participants. Clayton County as an employer, this is our scorecard. We asked the participants to rate us on a scale of one to five, one being the lowest and of course five being the highest. Overall, we had an average star ranking of 3.5. 8% of the participants ranked us at a one. 8% or 47 employees ranked us at a two. 30% of our employees ranked Clayton County as an employer at a three. 34% or 186 employees rate Clayton County as a four. And 20% of our participants, 111 employees, gave us the top score of five, which gave us the average ranking of 3.5, which is not bad. This is good. But of course, there is still room for improvement. What percentage of employees are actively seeking employment? But well, this shows us that 23% of our employees are indeed actively seeking employment elsewhere, whereas 77% indicated that they are not actively seeking employment elsewhere. Now, this, is, this number bears some significance. The significance of this is that if you are actively seeking, that means you're sending out applications, you're looking for jobs, sending out resumes, so on and so forth, one would even be able to say that's a job in and of itself. And that takes time. It cannot be assumed that employees are not taking this time while on their county jobs, on county time. It is important for leaders to actively manage our employees to keep them engaged in Clayton County business. Would you recommend Clayton County as a good place to work for? It's one of the questions on our state survey. 66 of the employees say yes. Whereas 34 of our participants stated no. Even though this is low, it is important to stay in front of this. Word of mouth is a very powerful tool in regards to marketing our jobs. To a certain extent, we have some control over the narrative here. And this is for our leaders. We must continue and improve upon making Clayton County Board of Commissioners a place people want to work. We not only obtain quantitative data, but we also obtain qualitative data through our 2021 state survey. One question on the survey was, what prompted you to apply, excuse me, what prompted you to apply for a job with Clayton County? One of the top responses is location, location, location. Community was very important as well. Service community, based on the results, is very big for our employees. 
stability, having stability and having a steady income, and also the reputation of Clayton County Board of Commissioners. Why do you stay with Clayton County? One of the top responses was our retirement package. We have a very good pension that appears to be uh, marketable. Security and stability, being close to home, and the co-workers was top reasons why employees stay with Clayton County. Now, as being the person who conducts the exit interviews in person, I am the primary in conducting exit interviews. And when I asked what made your employment here with Clayton County enjoyable throughout your tenure, the most common response was co-workers. What in your work environment would you change if you could change something immediately? The top response is? You guessed it, compensation. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> After that, having more staff and a manageable workload, <laughs> leadership and support, and advancement opportunities. But I wanted to go up to the more staff and manageable workload. Um, there were some people got very vocal in regards to their responses. <laughs> Performance punishment. Apparently, there's an issue some employees have where if you are a top performer, you are given the workload of your lower performer counterparts. And a lot of our employees feel as though that is performance punishment, something as leaders we should all be aware of. Um, there is a quote, and I'm going to paraphrase. The quickest way to kill a good employee is to, slap, is to allow him to see you tolerate a negative one. What are your motivators? The top response was pride in work. All right. People in Clayton County who work here are proud of the work that they do. They love what they do. Leadership support and involvement, various activities going on, a good work environment. And while this is something that uh, people would change, compensation was not the top motivator. It was not the top motivator, but it is one of the top responses. Now, Clayton County, our job is to look at these motivators to see what type of initiatives we can promote. And at this point, I will give the floor back, back to my leader, Director Ambles, to complete. Well, you're doing such a great role. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go on then. Thank you so much, Ryan. To wrap it up, um, our perspective, Human Resources wants to continue in hand, in, enhance our current initiatives. We do want to map an action plan so that we can start looking into the 2022 proposed initiatives. I know establishing the uh, resource center, that's gonna be a heavy lift. I know there may be a lot of legal challenges. That's why we'll be working with reaching out to Chuck team and working with him, as well as trying to work with the business owners. We're gonna be working with Chuck Finance, Economic Development. We can't do it on our own. We need, um, we need the help of our um, departments. Exit interviews, in 2021, you heard Ryan mention the exit interviews. We worked with over 800 exit interviews. What we found is that supervisor relationship is the top reason why employees leave as well. We, we, that, that is just constantly uh, repeated. It is often said that employees don't really leave an organization nine times out of ten they're leaving the environment. In response to that, since we have seen it in, in, in several of the slides before and the importance uh, thereof of it, we have an excellent um, internal professional development program. We have a curriculum for employees and we have a curriculum for leadership. One of our leadership classes is actually shining the light on leadership. That's a one-day class. Most of the time, employees are promoted based on their technical ability. They can work rings around uh, the others. But there is a different set of skills that is needed, that, that's, that set is needed for leadership to be effective. It is not easy making the transition from employee to leadership. When I was the trainer at the employee level, I tried to instruct those classes with a future focus on the day when the employees would step into a leadership role. We would really like to mandate this particular class 
for every employee who is considered for promotion. Go ahead, it's free of charge. We're already paying for it, it's free of charge. Mr. Ryan Shaw is now responsible for training as well and would be the one to teach this class. But when you become a leader, and I found this out because I started out as Chief Ronnie Clackham's principal secretary at the police department, when you become a leader, there's just a different set of skills. The technical, the behavioral, as well as the strategical skills have to be in place for us to be effective. Uh, as leaders. One other thing that's not up there is um, community is so important to our employees. And I will say every single employee here at the county is uh, valued and appreciated. But there is a majority of our employees who are in fact Clayton County citizen. We have over 50 percent of our employees who are also Clayton County citizens. So you will see community come up time and time again. Commissioner Gregory and I, and Dietrich, I, you probably can recall as well, was working on a volunteerism policy for Clayton County. We never did set a date to actually bring it to the board, but that policy I've, I've already um, developed it, haven't ran it by the COO yet for his uh, input. But since there is such a, just a passion for service among our employees, I would like to see us take, take a second look at that to see if we, can, um, uh, if we can put that particular policy in place. Once again, I thank you all so very much for your support for all that you do. And um, I'll end it right here. Are there any questions for Ryan or all right, any questions for Ms. Ambles or for Mr. Shaw? I have a question. I have one. Hold on a second. Uh, Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Um, I have several questions. The first question I have that has to do with the, with the discount program that you were talking about. Um, I was going to tell you Team Georgia has a discount program for, the, for state employees, and some of the things are on there for first responders, so you can kind of look at that and mirror it from that program and use the companies that are here right here in Clayton County as well as places like Six Flags and things of that nature and uh, mirror that together. So that would be a great site for you to start looking at for that discount program. Um, I just wanted to ask, first of all, how many people um, and with it, how many employees actually took the survey, the state it, survey? It was 557. And, and that was out of, was that everyone, of, mm -hmm. out of how many employees? Well, let, no, ma'am. Uh, ideally, we would have, we wanted, well, ideally, when it, when it comes to surveying, 30% mm -hmm. is the ideal. And for us, we have about almost 2,600 employees. Okay. I said traditionally our employees, they have, they just traditionally, they have not participated, mm -hmm. but they are stepping up to the plate. Okay. And I think a lot of that has to do, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that had to do with trust, but we'll see. We'll, we're, we're definitely build, building trust uh, among our employees, and they are participating. Commissioner, I was just hoping that we got 500. So when I and I was monitoring it every day, mm -hmm. and when we got to the 500, I was so excited, and then it kept going. I'm like, go, 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 go. Uh, we were excited about that because this represents. I don't want to stand here and give false information, but this represents a high increase in what we had in 2019. We didn't do one for 2020 because the COVID onset and all of that. But the 557 represents a high uh, number, a higher number than we had before. So I'm looking forward to see what the next survey, which will be conducted at the end of this year, looking forward to see what it's going to be like. And I'd like for you all to push that number because if we want to get the true data and um, the true validity of the surveys, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we have all 2,600 employees. I know it's going. I know it's hard mm -hmm. uh, because of trust issues with and relationships mm -hmm. with um, supervisors. But that's something that we're going to have to work on, and you all are going to have to come up with some team building skills and things of that nature. Because you're right. You know, true supervisors. I've had to turn into being a true uh, supervisor over people as well. But at the end of the day, you've got to make sure that you take care of people either way it goes and treat people right. 
And that's what true supervisors need to know. Yes, ma'am. And that's how you keep good people. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so ma'am. So we need to reiterate that throughout, you know, throughout. We talked about this at the retreat, and I'm, t I'm going to talk about it now in front of the public. We need to make sure that we reiterate that through through the whole Clayton County, through mm -hmm. our whole government, through our whole system. And so, again, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to ask the people, don't be afraid to take care of the sur take the survey because you have a board um, that wants to know. We want to know what's going on. And if we can fix it, that's our job. We want to fix it because we want Clayton County, again, to be the best person li place to live, work, yes, eat, right. play, and learn. Yes, ma'am. So, again, um, I'm going to say to the employees, do not be afraid. Take the survey yes, because I want to know what's going on. Yes, ma'am. And if people are there that don't know how to treat people then. You know, we just have to do what we need to do. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Commissioner Adler. Mm. Yes, I would like to know what happens with the exit interviews. Well, who did, we need, we really want to ramp up that process, Commissioner Hambrick. And Ryan can speak to this as well because he's the one who actually conducts uh, the exit interviews for us. Um, the, the current process is human resources. We don't know that an employee is leaving until we actually get the personnel action telling us that that person, you know, uh, it, the uh, process to exit that person out of the system. When we get that survey, we immediately make contact. When we get that information, we immediately make contact. If we can't catch the employee, and ideally we want to catch them before they get out of here, if we can't catch the employee, um, before they leave, then Ryan, and he's, he's assisted in this responsibility by Ms. Ebony Austin. She wanted to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, he's, he, either Ryan or Ebony will, call, will actually reach out, phone, email, regular mail, to try to get that employee to take that particular survey. What we have, what we've started doing is we're looking, we're analyzing, we are reviewing the data for different, we're looking for different things. As, as Ryan said today, we look at that, we, we should be, and that's what we're currently doing, looking at that qualitative data so that we can see whatever patterns that may be out there and trying to come up with different ways that we can interject and, and to create a positive influence to encourage the employees to stay. Now, if we see something, and, and there was one incident where we saw something that was very concerning to us, if we see something that's very concerning, where there's charges of some type of violation of civil service rules or violation of uh, the employment laws or something, then we have to take it a step further immediately and reach out to those who we need to reach out to. But Ryan, do you have anything to add to that about the exit interviews? Um, well, you basically summed it up. The main difficulty is getting the exit interviews out. Uh, a lot of times we get the personnel action form after the person has left and then we right. send the actual essay interview out to the employees. Sometimes they return it back to us, sometimes they do not. A lot of times they do not. But when we do receive the essay interviews, either myself or Ms. Ebony Austin, we review it. If there's some information in there that is just horrendous, not even horrendous, very, very concerning, I then relay that to my chain of command for action. Then where does it go? Then we make a copy, we put a copy in their personnel, or actually we put the original in their personnel file, and then we keep a copy in our file for data purposes. At the end of the year, we tabulate everything. How many did we send out? How many responses did we receive? Yeah, well, you want that information, Mr. COO? Yes, Commissioner. So in some instances, when there's been something that might have risen to the level of being egregious, Director Ambrose does, she will notify my office of what's going on. And in some instances, we had to um, conduct an internal investigation to find out the validity of what was taking place. In some areas, it didn't rise to the level of what was communicated or we found out the findings didn't. So in some instances, I do receive information from HR regarding issues with um, extra interviews that may be problematic for, for the organization. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one more question as we close out. Um, I noticed you when you all were talking about the high performers, you were saying the, most of those people thought they were giving more work when they did their job. Um, I'm going to suggest that we start looking at investing in our high performers, uh, making sure that, um, you know, we give them the opportunities to move up. 
um, you know, and so that is something that we need to start doing, uh, growing our own leaders mm -hmm. and making sure they are high performers that are moving, that, are, that our high performers are moving up into those positions because they deserve them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We what we did is we kind of we looked at the data. Ryan, was it five years and less, and then five plus? So we looked at the data because we wanted to try to see the correlation between the ones who have been here for a while mm -hmm. versus the ones who you know are newer. And we did find among those who have been here five years and five plus years that they do feel that. Um, you know, the workload is excessive because instead of managing the situation with the poor performer, well, here, Ryan, you do it, and we'll just we'll keep it moving. Uh, when I was trainer, I had one of um, our employees to call that the performance punishment. You're, perf you're punished because they, the leadership know you're going to do your job. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, let me say this, uh, Ms. Ambos, I work with you every day. I see your level of commitment to the employees and your dedication, not only on your behalf, but your staff yeah. as well. And I really appreciate the way you go after these initiatives and programs for the betterment of, the, uh, of our employees. But you take it one step further, you always keep the citizens in mind as well. So I appreciate all that you do, and I appreciate the presentation today. Well, thank thank you. you, and kudos to Human Resources. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, yes. can we have a point of privilege to move up the LCI presentation for contiguity purposes? To have them come up next. The Aerotropolis grant process. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. James, are you prepared to come at this time? Absolutely. And I extend my apologies to the other employees, uh, but uh, there's been a request to move him up. So that's an LCI grant application. I think I'm ready. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or evening now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, commissioners, evening. staff and residents of Clayton County. Congratulations, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. I think this is our first time connecting. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman, and also board member for the Aerotropolis Atlanta Alliance for moving me up. And I think there's tons of continuity between us and, uh, and Kane. And so I will be presenting this, uh, this evening about our hopes to move forward with a regional LCI grant application. And so we've been doing a ton of work of just building consensus, having tons of conversations and ideas around how can we move this forward. And I'll tell you, uh, we've uncovered a lot. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. I'm Shannon James, uh, President and CEO of the Aerotropolis Atlanta Alliance. So is this, uh, okay, green? Right, awesome, uh -huh. All right, so I'll do my best to be as brief as I can. I understand we've got a full agenda and um, so I'll be respectful. So here's a snapshot of, our, of my agenda today. I'll be speaking about the regional land use study that we did in 2020, as well as the collaboration that has been brought forth across the region and the county for this process, as well as the ARC LCI program, for those who may not be as familiar, around the goals, priorities, the study area, and the participation match, as well as the next steps, and then around for Q&A. So I want to at least provide some clarity or some context, some historical context around how we've, as an organization, have gotten to this point. In 2019, uh, some of you may remember, we went after a regional CDAP grant application, which is a Community Development Assistance Program grant through the ARC. This was 2019. It was the first 13 jurisdiction collaboration that was submitted to the ARC, and it was approved with flying colors. And so Clayton County and South Fulton cities all worked together over a span of roughly six to eight months, almost eight months roughly, just understanding what's going on in our region around land use, especially as it correlates to jurisdictions and transportation and connectivity. Here's a good snapshot of the study area. 
uh, in which we, as a region, really took a deep dive around. I'm not sure if this has a light on it or not, but what, what we were able to uncover, as you can see here, are areas of opportunity, especially around redevelopment corridors. And it was quickly identified the connectivity with Terra Boulevard, as well as Jonesboro Road and Highway 85. Here is a good snapshot of some of the information we received from key stakeholders uh, during our process that really correlates to the corridor. Uh, they mentioned, you know, beautification, connectivity, wayfinding, uh, mixed use, transit oriented development, things that we're hearing today, honestly, uh, that are very consistent with what we really honestly need to really advance this regional idea around Terra Boulevard. Uh, we, we've heard design standards, safety, all of these elements were brought up during a really almost eight month process of engaging the community, key stakeholders to understand how do we get information to better respond. Now, since that study in 2020, I know it's a bit of a blur, right? We've had the pandemic, we were still in the pandemic, but we never slowed down in advancing the idea, right? And so we were able to really have many dialogues. It started with the chairman uh, when we were having dialogues around the, the corridors, right? Jonesboro Road, Terra Boulevard, what's the importance? What's the priority? And then those conversations actually led to more dialogue with CCMA, uh, Clayton County Municipal Association, which we presented thanks to Councilwoman Marcy Flewellen with the city of Lovejoy. And during that time period, we were able to uncover that the city of Jonesboro, thanks to Ricky Clark, and Mayor Day, they were also planning, right, this idea around Terra Boulevard and connectivity and design standards. And so, you know, it was just recommended during this conversation, Chairman Turner was there, uh, Office of Economic Development was there, Commissioner Davis was there, we we're all in the room. And so the idea was, well, let's make this more of a regional connection versus just Jonesboro and the county, let's include Lovejoy. Well, we reconvened, Commissioner Franklin Warner, uh, we had basically almost everyone on the call, basically, talking about, you know, our concept to move forward around this boulevard. So as a result, we all agreed that it made sense. We wanted to work together and collaborate. Let's find a consensus around how do we now move this forward to actually apply for an LCI grant uh, through the ARC. And I'll take a step back before I go into the LCI grant. We've had several conversations with the Atlanta Regional Commission. We understand that this is a very long corridor, but I want to add to you that we're not only looking at Terra Boulevard, we're also looking at Roosevelt Highway in South Fulton, which is 24 miles. Terra Boulevard, based on our estimations of coverage, is about 11.6, and you'll see that here. So we totally think this is a very doable project, and once you see later in my presentation around uh, the participation match, we feel very confident that we can meet that threshold. Now, I think everyone's relatively familiar with the LCI program, uh, but it is really to help encourage diversity, housing, employment, shopping, land uses really around transit stations, local and regional centers that are accessible to all people, ages, abilities, and income levels. You know, I think you all have all the PowerPoints, so I won't read verbatim, but the LCI program goals are really to help breed travel nodes and roadways and walking and connectivity, green infrastructure, uh, smart infrastructure, if you will. And what we're looking at is a catalytic study, right? We're looking to really create an LCI throughout the entire corridor. What we also came to recognize and realize through this process, after being approved, if we're approved for this study, through an LCI, it literally sets you up for TIP funding, right? Well, in order to receive TIP funding, you have to be, uh, L I think it's LCP, LPA, I, I got to get the acronym <laughs> correct. I got so many running my mind. <laughs> certified, right? You have to be certified LAP. I do believe that's the acronym. So what we come to understand is that the county is LAP certified, but city of Jonesboro is not. City of Lovejoy is not. So in order for that to really happen throughout the fruition of the corridor, now this process has really helped us work closely with Jonesboro and Lovejoy to now get themselves LAP certified. Now, our priority issues for this corridor on top of connectivity and, and green infrastructure and, and smart infrastructure, we're looking to really think about creative placemaking and affordable housing, all right? Everything that Kane mentioned, I think is spot on, right? This effort will help position the county 
to almost assure themselves for funding, honestly, because the LCI program basically validates that you've done the work, right? And that there's a accredited regional organization that validates that, and then all the other funding mechanisms fall into place. Now, the study area. What we've done is really taken a good look at Terra Boulevard and a deep dive analysis, and based on where we've looked at the starting point for Terra, and we've had dialogue with the city of Forest Park because we've had some conversations that it may touch unincorporated Forest Park, but I think we're in good shape for just unincorporated Clayton County. So from the top of Terra to Jonesboro, we're looking at 11.6 miles. Now again, we'll work with the county if we're, if we're approved to move forward to get this you know, down to the exact number, but this is based on our, our due diligence. And based on those sections, unincorporated Clayton County uh, inhibits roughly 8.22 miles. Jonesboro, 1.95, Lovejoy, 1.43. What we're looking at is a $400,000 grant, right? That $400,000 grant requires a participation match at 20%. 80,000, so roughly unincorporated manages roughly 71% of the area of Terra Boulevard. If you take that 8.22 miles and you take it, multiply by that 71%, you're gonna get 56.8. So the percentage of responsibility for Clayton County would be 56.8. We're also asking for Clayton County to serve as the local government agency. So they would serve as the, you would serve as the host applicant and we work very closely, right? We'd be literally hand in hand, honestly. But the county would serve as host applicant with letters of commitment from Jonesboro and Lovejoy, and we are in conversations with both cities and they are in full support. Ah. So next steps, what we would like to do, honestly, with the decision from the council, from the commission, uh, to hopefully start the process. Uh, we feel we, we have a really good firm start and setting an idea but there needs to be more a minutia, if you will, building. So we're not creating the plan for the county. The county is creating the plan. And we're working with the county to make sure it's consistent. We're looking to receive letters of commitment from the county and the cities by Friday, the 25th of this month, with the idea to submit on the 28th. The projects will be announced in April with, a, with June, contact with the sponsor, and November, i.e. project complete. I'll yield for any questions or comments. I just want to say, uh, can I speak, Chairman? Yes, go ahead. I just want to say thank you for coming with a plan <laughs> and some dates <laughs> um, so we can move forward. Yes, ma'am. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Mm, thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? <laughs> Great job, Shannon. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Yep. So we appreciate the uh, yeah. information and look forward to it. only makes sense, so we only need to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, all parties involved are like-minded and looking to really make something happen. This is an opportunity to make it happen. So I appreciate you being here today. And if you need anything, you got the numbers, right? You know I do. Yes. I, I do yes. want to share one thing with the commissioners and for public knowledge, I guess, at this point. We're getting a lot of conversations about opportunities for funding. This is the first step. That's what I wanted to get out, yes. Um, before you leave, I, first of all, as everyone has already stated, thank you for doing this. Secondly, I want people to understand that, as you mentioned, it's only the first step to really rebuild that corridor that is really the one of the major thoroughfares entering into Clayton County. Mm -hmm. And it's going to allow us to be able to continue to build on with the funding that prayerfully we'll receive with the tip that we put in for thanks to Jonathan Ravenall and Kane for helping us with that because I know you had to do your own projects with ATL but you all helping us with that allows for us to get that funding so it's funding on top of funding to really move in the right direction to really make sure that there are li there's lighting on that street there there are sidewalks on that street and then I want us to take it a step further because when we look at the call for projects I remember what stuck out to me was that in one corridor up on the north end of town included in their project was for sidewalks for ADA compliant sidewalks mm -hmm. and that blew my mind mm -hmm. until I got on the mm -hmm. ATL board mm -hmm. I never thought of transit involving sidewalks and safety mm -hmm. so what's huge about this that I want this board to really take away 
is when we're talking about transportation and mobility, it starts with first mile to last mile. And so that means for people to get safely from their homes to either a place of business, place of shopping, or doctors, wherever that may be. And if we can develop out, as we talked about earlier, this LCI plan, which will lay the foundation for us to have that comprehensive plan, which also allows for us to be more competitive mm -hmm. so that we can pull down more federal dollars as we continue to build on the county, it's a win, 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 and a fourth win situation. So we can finally get to where we need to be. And that's where our density needs to go board. When we're talking about building out, when we're approving uh, various projects, look at the 85 corridor, the 1941 corridor, which is Georgia 3. Look at your corridor. That's where you want to have that density intentional because then it goes back to what Kane was telling us to develop out those transient oriented development communities, which is gonna be huge. I think Clayton doesn't realize how beautifully we are positioned to really see an amazing amount of economic growth. But the key to it is the connectivity because we've been working in silos. Y'all been working. We didn't quite understand how we could pull you in. You've been working. So I am just ecstatic with the questions that have been asked today between the two presentations. And I just thank Madam Vice Chair for bringing it up that we needed to move it up for contiguity purposes because you all have laid the roadmap for success out for us today. It's up to us to enact it. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the National Park Review fees, Mr. Hodges. I just want to come greet y'all before you leave. All right, good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. I want to bring forth the uh, International Park and Spivey Splash Water Park fees and charges that we plan on implementing here within the next a uh, month or so. First one we'll start with is uh, the International Park with the renovation, renovation of the VIP complex. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, level one in, uh, we can go over each and every one, but uh, basically we're going up on the fees for our rental charges for the VIP complex. Um, we have several other meeting rooms and what we're calling a, um, a groom's room. We have a bridal suite that is included in our uh, VIP rental, but we've never had a groom's suite. So that will now be a, um, a groom's suite for slash game room, which will be when we do the weddings or if you're doing a family reunion or something, uh, it could be a, a game room. And these are, um, will be implemented this coming rental season, which will begin May, May-ish of 2022. You want to, do we have any questions on international, on this portion, or do you want to move on to the water park? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, the 150 slash 350, is it going, is it presently 150? I'm sorry, yeah, the, the first, the first number is what we previously charged last year. Second number is what they're going to. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're going to or that's what you're proposing? Well, unless we hear differently. Oh, that's a big jump. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's yeah, a big that's jump. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the renovations down, call for that. Um, you know, and, you know, it's more in line with you know the the rentals around here you know i understand we were low go, yeah, go ahead, John, because of the shape of the the previous building uh previously but now that that building is uh well above any of the others around here so that's why the need so, so what are you comparing it with i mean how are you coming up you with said these figures? prices are comparable to other events correct centers, i guess uh pristine or what other pardon what, what, what? Pristine Chapel is one of them. Oh, um, nobody ever compete with that. Yeah, Are we trying to compete well, with them? It's just a rental facility. I mean, that's have, always been out of reach. I think yeah, what we have to keep in mind 13, is that 000, we are a, a government <laughs> facility, and they are yeah, a, a private that. facility. And though um, I, I see us as being in line with it, um, I have to ask ourselves, is this going to be out of range for many of our, or is there a 
a county uh, resident cost here, or is this just across the board? I, I think we want to be cognizant thinking of that as well. But you know, my 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 mindset is that yeah, we want to be able to cover our costs, but we're not a for-profit company here in doing this. Okay, what cost? What cost are we trying to recoup? We, well, I mean, we have to staff it. No, I'm not asking oh, you. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on up no, here. <laughs> well, you can go. <laughs> sure. Dietrich can speak to that. Commissioner, one of the things, um, Commissioner Davis, you're correct. One of the challenges we've always had with the water park and the VIP is that we've always vacillated between whether or not we want to have public fees versus being an enterprise facility. Mm -hmm. And so we've always tried to recoup a portion of the staffing costs. The reason why the cost is escalated now, it would cover the entire cost for the staff and in some instances the depreciation mm -hmm. on some of the equipment. And so the other part of this, that the presentation, traditionally, you remember the VIP complex really only consists of that large room and then the bridal suite. You remember the other suites used to traditionally be offices. So now that we've done the renovations, those now are meeting places. So what we now have an opportunity to do is what we call B conference type activities. One of the challenges that we used to have, we didn't have the ability to really attract small conferences because we didn't have the breakout space. What we have now is we have that ability to do that because we have the three breakout rooms to include the first level as well as the second level. Now, I concur with you wholeheartedly. If this board feels that you know the price point should not be so much comparable to the market, then certainly we can come back with a revision. But the goal here initially was to try to figure out ways that we can recoup some of our funding because of the, the asset, because of the depreciation in equipment. This will give us an opportunity to put money back into the coffers to cover that. Uh, well, can we think about, just a thought, of uh, considering, like you say, maybe family reunions and then a business side, you know, if a business wants to come in and, and have uh, a, some scale okay. for that as opposed to uh, maybe a private birthday party or something, just just a thought, because this, this, I'm looking at this and, you know, I like the facilities, but that. That's yeah, steep. And we still allow 501Cs uh, yeah. opportunity for our half Right, off, and if correct. you think about it, you know, we get so many 501C3s, mm -hmm. you know, if say, for instance, if they want to come and rent the VIP, it's not $500, it's $250. Yeah, but um, we, don't, so we aren't seeing that on, your, on the scale here. Well, no, that's, that's you've got to present your, your uh, paperwork that you are 501C. But it's still so how everybody knows so we have, so we have 500. So if you go down to 400 mm -hmm. or, or 300, then that's going to be 150. What we can come back with is providing you all those impacted opportunities so you'll see what that is to the commissioner's point. Uh, we, are, we recognize in the policy it rec it, we have nonprofit fees, but you need to see that so you'll know what that impact will be. So we can certainly I see the add that information. Ma'am? I want to see the facility it's too, and see if it if it really amounts up to this, you know, kind of jump. So okay. what I may propose then is this, that we hold this until the commissioners have a chance to review it, and then you come up with some alternatives in terms of pricing. Right. I'm not. I'm not saying don't increase, and I understand no, I that. But I mean, this just looks like a big jump. I th so, Commissioner Franklin. Yes, I'm sorry, um, we're just getting in. But the point is, I think this is a start. I think we do need to do, <coughs> as Madam Vice Chair stated. But additionally, what I'd like to see is really for um, <coughs> residents to be able to receive a discount, those that are residents of the county. Because that's what Rockdale County does. And, um, and therefore, the residents who are paying the taxes that are running the facility get that benefit so i definitely want to see that more so more than nonprofits. i think that when it comes to nonprofits, we need to switch that so it's okay to give them a discount but if you got a nonprofit out of another area why are they receiving a discount off for the backs of the citizens who live here the d discount need to come in for those who are residents of this county who pay in the taxes for this facility that's what i want to see and then, of course, that discount can extend to even employees. Mm -hmm. Your point well taken, Commissioner. Add that into the mix. Got it. I have, right. I have, I have one question. I see, 
um, you got level one and two. Maybe I'm confused. You got seven hundred, and then it went down. It's going down to five hundred. Now that, that that is a, I didn't catch that one until a minute ago, but it is one thousand. It goes to one thousand, no five hundred. Seven hundred to one thousand. Correct. <coughs> Three hundred dollars. Then you have um, thirteen hundred, and it's going down to a thousand. Or what is, is it going up to what? That's a great point. Which one is that? The uh, security, security <coughs> deposit? deposit. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's going to go up to two. How much? To one thousand. So it's going, going down. down. Is it that's going, going down? down. It's right. going it's down. It's going to be all in one. All right. So that'll go down. All right. But I I, I agree with um, the other commissioners. You know, I, we we do want to keep these the level of pay, um, especially for our um, for the people that live in the county. We want to keep it. You know. Um, bearable where they can afford it and so again I, I, yeah, I agree we need to look back into this and just kind of just bring something back and like you said for the 501c3s just as Commissioner Franklin said people who live in the county uh, making sure that they get the discounts yeah. to use our facilities I'm fine with the rates other than that we yeah need to get it low so we will just get another, mo another uh, document like this but it's just more than detailing each individual entity and what the cost would be well, Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? I think I see Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm still thinking, you know, a lot of times you see uh, s different s scales, sliding scales, and again, for businesses mm -hmm. that want to come to Clayton and use the facility for whatever reason. And also, so, and I can see it being a beautiful facility. And I've, you know, been watching it um, for the last two years. And, uh, and well, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going to he's going to revamp the scale. So, if there's additional things you would like to see, just please get in well, touch with the CEO and uh, you know, work with uh, Director Hodges before, to make sure that's important. Before you walk away, I think it's imperative that we understand. <laughs> oh Lord, it's imperative that we understand that um, that citizens still have access to other facilities. This is like a kind of a, um, a more of a, um, how do you say it, a tiered facility, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So my concern to the board as we're having this discussion for what you all are going to bring back is really not so much lowering what you're presenting because I, what I don't want is for a film crew to come in here and then they take advantage of all these low, 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 low rates when they <laughs> that, could that's what I we could about benefit the business more. side. Yes. So okay, so we're on the same page. Yeah, so for be. filming and business, keep it on that level. Yeah. But for residents, residents should be able to have it for less cost. So that way the folks that are coming in temporarily, like I said in other counties, they're paying those rates. But the folks that are paying the taxes here, they get the discount. That's what we really need to see. And Mr. Chairman, also that's let's right. don't forget about our seniors too. Cause they're, they're, oh, they're going to always get a discount. Yeah, they yes. definitely need, well, we need to see it in there. So, so. Thanks, Troy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. oh you got more. <laughs> you should have took that out, buddy. You should have took that out. Go sorry, ahead. sorry, sorry. All right, the next one is the Spivey Splash Water Park, and I can, I can picture along the same lines of what I need to go back and do, but we'll give it a shot anyway. All right, so the adult prices, as you can see, is for the Spivey Splash Water Park. We're going to a over 48 inch and under 48 inch uh, price point simply because of the attractions in the water park. It's not a um, um, over 12 years old or anything like that. It's more of a height thing, but 17, 13, and 10, um, two, two and under are free. Uh, the flow, there's a uh, piece of equipment there called the flow rider. It's a surfing um, type thing. There's more liability if the participant stands up. So they have to complete a waiver and we will charge them an additional $5 to do that. Uh, not many people will take part in that as, except for your surfers and stuff like that. Uh, the sky trail, there's a ropes course there. That'll be a $10 charge. Uh, in groups of 20 or more uh, can pre-purchase tickets. This will be like your, some of you, the commissioners are used to 
you rent a pavilion, you can have a group rate and pre-purchase X amount of tickets, and that'll be the $12 charge for that. And we are also now implementing a twilight swim that, uh, you know, after 5 p.m., it is a $10 charge. Sometimes it don't get dark till about 9 o'clock. Right, right. Yeah, and we do have lights now, so. They need to be charged more at the twilight, don't they? The, right, the price go up when you go to the club after the free hours. <laughs> <laughs> we working backwards we here. What you're, what you're doing, Commissioner, is actually <laughs> you're maximizing your programming time. So a lot of people will come to the park at 11 or 12 when you open up so they stay all day. And so individuals don't want to pay that full rate. But if they know that, they can get a discounted rate oh, okay. coming for a, a smaller period of time. <laughs> they want to pay a lesser rate. I, I get it. Thank you for that yeah, clarity. Five and nine. <laughs> and, th and this is where our and the season passes is where our residents discount comes into play uh, it's a $25 discount uh, off of the uh, $75 season pass rate if you're a resident you get the season pass for $50 uh, for the entire season uh, this and we have a uh, splash package as well this is for basically our uh, businesses, daycares during the summer that want to uh, purchase, you know, a package to come in and bring their group. Okay. The hours of operation that um, the water park for the water park will be 11 to 7. <clears throat> the, uh, Monday through, excuse me, Tuesday through Friday, it'll be closed on Monday. Uh, Saturday is 10 to 8, and Sunday would be from noon to 7. Nice. Um, the operating dates would be Memorial Day, which is Memorial Day Saturday to the 28th, through Labor Day uh, Monday, which is September the 5th. We plan on having three dates for fireworks, which will be um, Memorial Day, <laughs> Saturday, July 2nd, and then again on Labor Day. <coughs> We're good so far? Yep. Can we Keep talk going. about salaries now? Maybe? Uh, okay, hold, hold so. On, hold on a second. No, Come no, back. no. I was back to the war. I thought it was you were going on something else. I thought the uh, park was going to have the, what do you call that river? The Lazy River. Lazy river. river. Yes. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> are we, we are having that? Yeah, yes, yeah, there. It's, oh, the, okay. it's yes, the state's yes, longest yes. Lazy River. Okay, I didn't see that on, on the uh, previous case. Okay, no, I just didn't see it. Oops. Go ahead. All right, so we want to make sure, you know, currently, uh, just like everybody else, we're having a hard time attracting uh, part time employees at our current rates. Uh, so, in order to make sure we have the proper lifeguards and, you know, the uh, ticket takers and stuff like that we want to um, bring them up to a seasonal rate of uh, you know say for instance the lifeguard from eleven dollars and twenty four cents to fourteen dollars and thirty nine cents okay. and and so on so these are for our seasonal employees all the way down to uh, the ropes course attendant the lifeguard and the lead lifeguard and the ropes courts course attendant and the ticket sales supervisor of course are carry a, a lot more responsibility um, especially the ropes course attendant and the ticket sales supervisor basically handling all of the cash any questions there all right so basically we'll go back and uh, offer some residential discounts for the uh, rentals and that was pretty much it what you guys want to see I think they want to see a package for business the business community okay yeah residents so non-residents business community yeah okay. and, and residents and resident yeah. well he, he already said that one all right thank you so much I appreciate it thank you all right let's go to Mr. Reed and the uh, Ordinance 2022-20, which deals with parliamentary procedure, uh, Robert's Rules. Good evening, um, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board. I'm just going to quickly run through uh, the parliamentary procedures uh, ordinance, which is 
proposed ordinance 2022-20. Uh, just going to talk a little bit about the enactment of their parliamentary procedures, your history of amendments, and then discuss how the ordinance or what it proposed. Believe me, it's not going to be as long as that slide there. So um, 2007 is when you all first did your uh, present procedural rules. That's for that link there is for those who are watching at home. It's on the county's website. Um, that um, 2007, I'm sorry, the 2007, that's a typo, stated that um, for any event that's not covered by these meeting procedures, Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, shall control. Um, again, it should be 2007. That set forth your parliamentary structure, which is the main motion, debate, voting procedure, ranking of motions, subsidiary motions. All of these are covered in the subsection 2-36 that's presently in your um, ordinance. Privileged motions, incidental motions, supplementary, main motions, and abstentions. That was all was lined up in the 2007 um, uh, ordinance. In 2009, um, uh, you, uh, Ordinance 2009-37 amended to add a new um, 02-36-10 Finance Committee. Oops, sorry. So the 2000 Finance Committee standards that shows that it was supposed to be two uh, Board of Commissioners who were on that Finance Committee and their terms expired on 1231 of the appointment year. Uh, the purpose of that committee was to review matters that were referred to the committee. Um, and there were certain reporting requirements that uh, once it was referred to the committee, it had to come back to this board for uh, a report, either the next meeting, regular meeting, or if you decided that it has to come back at a certain other time, uh, it, that finance committee would report back whenever the board decided when that was going to be. Um, also required uh, monthly reports or gave the authority to review monthly reports that was um, prepared by the uh, then uh, director of finance and then also clarified, of course, that the meeting was subject um, to um, open meetings. That was in subsection B. Uh, in 2009, um, you all had another uh, ordinance that basically made changes to the number of meetings you had. At one point, you had three regular meetings. Changed the process for submitting things to the agenda, removing items from the agenda, establish a consent agenda. But it didn't change your meeting procedures, which I just highlighted a procedure there that said for any event not covered by these meeting procedures, Robert's Rules of Order newly revised shall control. That language still was there in, um, in the ordinance. Over a period of time, and I could go through each one of these. But you, you, over 2013, 2016, 2019, uh, you all have made changes to your parliamentary procedures. I've put in parentheses what those subjects um, relate to, your most recent being modifying your consent agenda so that it doesn't require a second to take it off the consent agenda. So that's kind of the amendments you've done so far. What this particular ordinance does, it repeals all subsections of section 2-36, all those ones that I named one through nine that was established back in, 20, in uh, 2007. The new 236 will simply read, Robert's Rules of Order, current edition is designated as the basic parliamentary authority of the Board of Commissioners. That's what, that's all new 236 will say. Um, it revises subsection B of 235, which, oops, which had that language that I referenced earlier saying that everything that's not covered by meeting procedures is covered by Robert's rule. Obviously, it doesn't, you don't need that anymore because Robert's rule covers everything. And then the last thing is moving, because we took everything out of 2-36, moving the finance committee to, to a new 2-38. Um, no change to the current structure. The only thing that does, uh, um, that's not in your current packet that will be uh, what you adopt is change the reference from director of finance to chief finance officer. Oops, sorry. And that's basically the overview of everything. Um, and so I'm leaving to any questions that you have. So I think when we brought this up the other day or, or last week, there, there was a question about the finance committee brought up by Commissioner uh, Franklin. So along those same lines, how relevant is the Finance Committee to 
our adoption of the Roberts rules? It's well, the for some reason when the board uh, adopted the finance committee, they put it in the parliamentary procedures. I don't know why it was placed there, but by clearing out everything in that parliamentary structure, it would have gotten rid of the finance committee, which is why I moved that section to its own standalone. But to answer your question, um, it doesn't have anything to do with parliamentary no. procedures. So if we just removed that all together, there would be no, it would not lessen the effects of the Roberts rules. That's correct. Okay. And we have an, uh, uh, Commissioner, go ahead. Um, I think it's imperative that we understand that we've not been following this. This whole finance committee, we've not, I don't, since I've been a commissioner, we've not chosen a board member to participate, gone by the terms, had the monthly reports. So what is of concern to me is that we have codes and ordinances that we don't follow, and that needs to be corrected. And um, the parliamentary procedures, I am glad that we are getting something a little more concrete. Um, but I'm glad to hear you say that one does not go with the other because it never that has nothing to do with parliamentary procedures. Um, I, I, for one, do support committees, but I think that the board needs to be included in the development of said committees. And um, even this whole thing about the finance committee, it needs to be looked at um, because we've not been doing it. Yeah. And we need a parliamentary. Or do you act as our parliamentary person to make sure we follow in our own guidelines? Because uh, we don't have meetings and not even following our own guidelines. The Finance Committee has nothing to do with parliamentary. So as far as if there's questions related to Robert's Rules of Order or your parliamentary process that was between, that's currently 2-36, 1 through 9, if there's questions that this board has or if there's something that comes up that's grossly outside of your procedures, I will bring that to your attention. But as far as the Finance Committee, that is not a parliamentary issue. I'm clear. So my last final question would be, during our process, who within this room is responsible to ensure that we as a board are abiding by our own county codes? So I mean, not just the board members, because we're here up here. Who's making sure that we're governing based upon our own codes? So this parliament, this um, finance committee um, was, I don't know the history of why it was placed in effect, but this, to my knowledge, since I've been in this space, there has not been a matter that this board has referred to a finance or referred to a finance committee that was made up of people other than two board of commissioners. So as far as there being a violation, I've not been aware of anything that this board has referred to a, to a finance committee that was operating outside of what this ordinance does. What has not happened is that there has been a monthly reports prepared by the director of finance, but then even arguably once you changed the title of that, there should have been a change uh, uh, to the ordinance to reflect that. So I'm, I'm not as concerned that you all have been operating outside of the law if you had then, you know, if you all had referred something to a finance committee and it was operating outside of this, I would certainly be much more concerned. But the fact is, you all have not ever, as far as I know, used a finance committee. May I make a mm. suggestion? Oh, hold on a second. Will you finish, Commissioner? I don't look at me, Madam Vice Chair. Go ahead. Um, how do we do away with the finance committee? Um, do we have a process? or You can do away with it. Um, by just simply saying we're repealing that section. So we do that in the meeting next week. I mean, if it's yeah. agreeable yeah. to all. Yeah. Sure. I mean, that's, um, I did not want to simply remove it without letting the board right. be I aware that that it. is there. Mm -hmm. And why, again, I, why it was placed there, that it was before I got here. I don't know why it was placed in that no, section. Not. That's for <laughs> right. all of us, except for maybe Madam so, Vice Chair. Um, but the finance department should have been aware of this so that we are in compliance. We paid a lot of money to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. So, but I agree with Commissioner. Yeah. Commissioner Davis. Can we just do, yeah, just yeah. Do whatever Hold we on. need Commissioner to do. Commissioner Davis, I guess my, my question is, 
what is the purpose of the finance committee and its role and uh he just answered all them questions. <laughs> there is no role. There is no well, Mr. Ch so how do we officially? So to answer your question, there is a role. This fine, the, the way that the board, the board of commissioners that enacted this finance committee, the purpose of the committee was to refer to review matters that was referred to the committee for further study remaining pertaining to the finances of the county that's what it says specifically here um and i guess i've heard that we've not used it we've not used the finance committee would it enhance uh, our um, efforts if we had it or does it not i guess is my question instead of just saying do we want to get rid of it it's a policy decision um, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, i'm sorry no, so it's a policy decision from this board. And I'll just use to say an example, the discussion that this board has had related to um, pay raises. If the board decided that they wanted to refer that to a finance committee, that may have been something that you wanted to do. There's no obligation that you, I mean, obviously you all didn't use that vehicle to come to the decision, but you could if you wanted to do such a thing. But we can do that anyway. You can do that anyway. It does not take a finance committee to put together a committee to mm -hmm. look at anything. Yes. Yeah. So no, we just this, we just yeah. So we for next week's meeting, meeting, please, uh, when you have this, I'm asking that the uh, repeal of the finance committee be added on there as well. And the approval of the separate Roberts Reed. Yeah, it'll be separate. Roberts 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 Roberts. Roberts. Yeah. Yes. separate. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Oh, yes, Commissioner. Um, we I'm, talked I'm about. I'm sorry, oh. I, I missed that last part. Did you say you wanted to have that done separately? Because I can do it all in one. As long as it's done oh, according okay. to that coming out of that portion sure. of the uh, Roberts Rules. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Anderson. Ordinances. We talked about this um, also in our retreat, like having a review of some of these ordinances. Um, we need to start going through, and I guess this is my Board of Education kicking in, <laughs> um, start going through these ordinances. Um, you, 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 you give them to us, we read, actually read through them. Either we keep them or do away with them because we need to start getting away, getting away from, you know, um, laws change um, throughout the year. And some of these things we don't need, like from 2009, we don't need it. If we don't need it, we don't need to have to talk about it. So, uh, you know, let's let's try. If we, you, you're, you all can look at it, um, and then we go through it together. And then after that, if we need it, we keep it. If we don't, we throw it away. On which section you talked about? Yeah. Well, procedural, procedural, I mean, ordinances, all of that. We just need to look at all of our, um, we need to look at everything at some point in time. I, um, I can, um, you and I can sit down and maybe talk about what would make sense because, okay. um, that's a if lot. I, that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot, but I mean, I, mean, right. I know it's a lot. Yeah, but I, and, and how I can present gotta, it to you. At some point in time, we got to streamline them because, again, laws change each year. So some of the things, it, we might be out of compliance. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that we're in compliance. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? No, I just want to um, real quick piggyback. You are correct. Excuse me. Definitely. Um, I would like for us to really look at the procedural aspect of the code to begin with. Um, but the, I knew, do, do know there's one port, part of the code that I brought up a few times about the trash, trash collectors have to be at the back of the property and we're approving properties or zoning that doesn't allow such. So commissioner is correct, but um, we do have to figure out how it makes sense. Yeah. Um, to be able to look at those that are contradictory and some of those um, older ordinances that are out there that really are not useful at this time. The older ones, mm -hmm. that is important. If uh, the board likes, what I can do is prepare. Um, there is a, um, a portion of the code that deals with the things that this board mm. deals with on the, I won't say day to day, but it's most immediate to you. Mm -hmm. I can provide you a summary of what those are, or even just provide you what the code sections are, just print them out, have you take a look at them, whichever way you like. 
And then if you have some things that you'd like to see changed, we could set up a work session for you all to tell me what things you'd like to see, what things you don't want to see, and, um, and we'll make those changes as you s desire. Definitely. Make hard copies. Okay. Espe and and yeah. especially with the authority of the commissioners. Yeah. I think that's clear. Um, I'm not going to prolong it, but we've had debates in the past when the code is very clear on said authority. So I think it's important, especially we have a new commissioner on. Will do. Thank you. All right, next up, trash amnesty, period. Who's presenting that? Clayton County Enterprise. Oh, is it? Did I miss one? I guess I was getting ahead myself. All right, Clayton County Enterprise uh, Fleet. Now, we're not going to have the nonprofit one. Okay. All right, again, good good afternoon or good evening, board. Um, one of the things we've been discussing lately is about our fleet management process. As you all know, we've gone through a, a, a quite a bit of changes um, since the pandemic and trying to figure out ways that we can be a little more creative about how we manage our fleet maintenance. One of the programs that we'll be bringing before you, um, one of the things we're all looking to do is looking at a, a reorg of that, that respective area. But prior to that, uh, we may have an opportunity when it becomes a maintenance and upkeep of some of our vehicles so that we're not elongating in our um, life cycle of a lot of our vehicles. So um, this evening we have Mr. Damon Martin from Enterprise um, in which we can actually, we already have a potential co-op opportunity with Enterprise to handle some of our work. I wanted him to kind of give you an overview. He worked with Director Motarco about looking at our fleet. He's provided kind of an assessment of what that looks like and one of the things that Enterprise may be able to help us with. So um, Mr. Martin said he would keep his presentation to 10 minutes, and uh, we'll certainly answer any questions you may have after that. So Mr. Martin. You said it. We're going to hold you to it. <laughs> Good afternoon. Excuse me. Good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioners. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, my name is Damon Martin. I'm with Enterprise Fleet Management. Um, we are the sister company of Enterprise Rental Car. I'm sure you, if you've rented a car, you might have seen us before. We'll come pick you up, but I'm on the fleet management side of, of the business. Uh, essentially, my job is to uh, work with cities and counties to find opportunities to help reduce the, the cost of operating their fleet of vehicles, to provide the county with safer, more reliable vehicles. Um, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Mr. Matarco, Mr. Stanford over the last few months to get all the data together and really put together a proposal and plan for the county that will help solve the, the issue of standing vehicles for too long and drive down the cost to the tune of around $6.7 million of savings over 10 years. Um, so I'll go right into it. That was the right one. Okay. So he's over. All right, I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip through it, some of the, some of the high level stuff. So um, the proof in the pudding, as, as a government entity, you guys buy incredibly well, um, just as well as probably better than enterprise holdings, right? And we buy $1.8 million, $8 million vehicles per year. The real opportunity that you have is buying an F-150 truck as a private citizen, you or, you or I, you know, it would be 37 grand. You guys can buy that vehicle for basically $12,000 cheaper. The real opportunity that the county has and what other cities and counties have is they keep, they, they stay in those vehicles for a little bit too long to the tune of, in Clayton County, around 13 years. What we've seen the opportunity is if we can figure out the right replacement time to get out of those vehicles, that will help bring money back into the county. Specifically right now with the vehicle market being really upside down and the, and the resale market being astronomical, a lot of the cities and counties are actually making money off their vehicles. As you can see it right here, a 2021 F-250, um, a regular sell price with 4,000 miles, essentially used is selling for around $35,000. You guys are buying that vehicle at $25,000 brand new. So essentially, you can run and operate that vehicle basically only doing old changes and tire rotations and being cost neutral, and in some instances, actually making money and bringing money back into the county. Okay, vehicle disposal. This is, this is kind of the secret sauce of Enterprise. Uh, Enterprise, we obviously rent vehicles, but we buy 1.8 million vehicles per year, and we sell about 1.1 million vehicles per year. So in between that, we rent the vehicles out, but we buy the same way you guys do, very cheap. And then after we rent those vehicles for a year, we put 20, 30,000 miles on them, and we sell them for basically more than what we paid for them. So that's the same type of 
uh, proposal that we're that we're doing for the counties and cities is leverage how well you buy vehicles to put money and keep money back in the county and keep those maintenance and fuel buckets as low as possible. This is just a simple simple slide just illustrating um, that it's not cost effective to stay in your vehicles for too long, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be different for each vehicle class. Um, so typically, we try to find that happy medium in the in between to where um, you know the old adage where you lose, lose half the depreciation once you drive off the lot. That's true, right? The fuel gets worse as the vehicle gets older. Maintenance gets worse as the, ve the vehicle gets older. So we try to figure that sweet spot when the appropriate time to gather vehicles and sell it on your behalf. And that's what we're going to do for each. What we have done for each vehicle class that you guys have in the county right now. Um, you, uh, you all have around 11, well, 11, 1,100 vehicles, 1,103 in the fleet currently, right now, light, light and medium duty. So this is a quick high-level snapshot. You'll find this in your proposal that I printed out for you as well. Um, this is a snapshot of the county fleet. Um, as you can see on the left, these are all your different vehicle classes. And what we want to come in and do is standardize each vehicle class to where if it's a half-ton truck, we know exactly what manufacturer we're going to do and what what the trim level is going to be for that truck so we can maximize the resale value on the back end. The number that stands out specifically um, that I, that I kind of highlighted before, there's 448 vehicles in the county right now over 10 years old, uh, which, is, which roughly estimates to be about 40%. Uh, we have about 60% of those 1,100 vehicles to be six years or older. Um, and with you guys staying in vehicles for around 13 years, um, in our proposal, we want to bring that holding period from 13 years down to four years. Um, any questions about mm -hmm. that? I know I'm moving kind of fast, but I want to. I want to. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The numbers make sense. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so when we looked at each different vehicle class, you can see on the quantity, um, that's the amount of vehicles that are in, in each vehicle class, um, and that's the term. The far right, you see 60. 60, 30, 6 on a few, 12 on a, on a few of those. So by each vehicle class, we've determined when's the right time to get out those, those vehicles. Mm -hmm. As you can see for the half-ton pickup trucks, we're looking at a 12-month flip, meaning that you will buy a vehicle and run it either from 12 to 24 months. We will sell it on your behalf, and like I said before, you'll be either cost neutral, or sometimes in this market you'll be making money. Um, and, it's, and it's per vehicle basis, and it's, it's determined by how well the county keeps up the vehicles from a maintenance standpoint and um, just making sure that the, the equity stays in the vehicles. All right, the fleet planning analysis. Um, with the help of uh, Mr. Matarco and uh, Mr. Stanford, we were able to get all the data and come up with your average maintenance amount <laughs> per vehicle per month, uh, which is around $146 per vehicle per month is what we're spending right now on maintenance. Uh, with us shortening the cycle from that 13 year of you, uh, you all holding the vehicles down to four years on average, um, we're estimating that over the 10 year, you're gonna see a savings of $6.7 million. That's a lot, man. And as, as you notice, mm -hmm. their fleet budget, the, 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 high, the yellow line right there, that's $6.4 million, that's what you, what you all spend uh, right now annually. Nothing's really changing on that line. So we're going to take the same dollars that you spend right now and just essentially execute on the proposal and bring that sustainable savings to the county. I'll leave it. Um, I'll go back and leave it to any questions or. Go back to who else is using, who's using this program. So currently you work with. Yes, ma'am. We do. Let me go to it. So um, here locally, we work with Sumter County, Rabin County, um, Cherokee County, City of Norcross, City of Roswell, City of Union City. And I can't forget, I work with uh, Mr. Ricky Clark over at City of Jonesboro as well. What's the largest? These cities don't have a lot of population. What's, what's the largest population? Um, City of Roswell would be the largest, largest population we work with. Now, I have to check workforce? with Sump Sump Sumter County as well. I'm sorry. Okay, so, yes, yeah, Sumter. I do their benefit. Yes, ma'am. You said Roswell. How many uh, vehicles are y'all supplying them with? So uh, I want to I, I want to say their fleet is over 400 vehicles. What are we right now, Mr. Seal? 1100. 1100. So your largest account has 400 vehicles. The largest uh, city that we have right in the in the state has 400 vehicles, and I have to check on Sumter. I know they don't have 400 vehicles. Yeah, I know Sumter doesn't. 
Right. So you're going to be able to accommodate the 1100? Yes, ma'am. We would be. <laughs> we would too. Well, the 1100, I don't see this being a viable program for public safety. For public safety? Yes. Has any of these cities, are they doing public safety vehicles? Um, yes, they are. Emergency response vehicles, police vehicles. Yes, yes, sir. We are doing all those vehicles. And what we do is we handle all of the aftermarket process. So from ordering that vehicle directly from the factory, coordinating that vehicle to get to an aftermarket to have all the lights, sirens, everything uh, installed in the vehicle. So our goal is to deliver it turnkey ready to go with all the equipment in it as well as decals. Will we still be able to use our local folks because I know there is a business right here in Clayton County that um, is well known across the U.S. and actually opened up a facility here in Clayton County um, because of the demand. So we would be able to continue to use that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, as long as we can do that, use our yes, folks, that's fine for me. Absolutely. So getting back to public safety and the part of it, um, the mileage. Yes, sir. What's the max amount of mileage? <laughs> That it's, I think I saw it somewhere. Yeah, it's un unlimited mileage. There's no mileage in where it or I'm where speaking of when you, we're not buying these vehicles new. We're buying them used. Correct. And one thing that prior years being law enforcement, we never opted to get used vehicles because we all know what we're getting from a law enforcement perspective. Never know what you get. So these guys are and ladies are running 100 miles an hour. Yes, sir. On a used vehicle, and you really don't know what you're, what you're doing. I know you go through your safety checks and all that. That would be my only concern in reference to the public safety, not to mention that if there's an accident, at the public safety guys, when they get in accidents, we know that's going to happen. But same we insurance. bought the car anyway. <laughs> but it's right? the, the same insurance applies. It would be. Yeah. Chairman, I only would add that um, we can we can – we can determine prioritization on this program. If there are certain elements that we want to exclude from the program, we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to go back to them and provide that. But I think the, the goal here was to provide the, the board a bigger snapshot and the totality of what the fleet um, challenges that we are faced with and trying to figure out some other alternatives opposed to continuing trying to figure out putting a Band-Aid on a, on a problem. But to your question, if we choose to exclude certain vehicles from the program, we can do that. Well, I think the, the input from our uh, sheriff and uh, uh, chiefs will be invaluable in reference to the, what they're seeing with uh, emergency vehicles. Yes, sir, Chairman. So, any other questions? Well, thank you, sir. Thank we you. appreciate you and uh, definitely something that we will be putting some thought behind. Awesome. Thank you all so much. All right. Trash amnesty, period. Come on up, Cap. Right. Go ahead, Mr. Ms. Stanford. Cap, you doing this presentation? <laughs> she, she, she up here to answer questions. Ch mm -hmm. We're we going to have some questions for her. Question. The chairman didn't know either. It's okay. All right. All right, board. So the genesis of this, this will be real quick. Um, the genesis of this, this presentation, um, there was an initial <laughs> conversation with Dr. Anderson with regard to ways that we can continue to make ourselves more visible in the community as we go through our quality of life check and trying to figure out ways we can handle some of the trash collection throughout the community. So one of the suggestions that we've been talking about for a minute is a trash amnesty day. Um, this is kind of giving you the framework of what that would consist of. Um, what is an amnesty day? It's just an opportunity for the citizens to bring large bulk items to um, a centralized location, and then we'll handle the proper disposal of those respective goods. Um, the tentative date associated with this um, program would be March 11th and 12th and March 18th and 19th. Um, the staff requirements right now, part of our kickoff meeting, we had a meeting with Corrections, um, Captain Gooden. Um, we had also um, PD. Chief Roberts, we also had um, Jeff Matarco with Transportation and Development. And then in essence, what will happen, um, code enforcement will be responsible for monitoring the Amnesty Day project that day. Um, so they'll be on hand to make sure the disposal items are within line and within the requirements that we set forth. 
PD will be responsible for the monitoring of the traffic on that respective location. And then transportation is working directly with the hauler or with the company that we're looking at utilizing with the dumpsters to see whether or not we actually remove the actual dumpsters or we actually contract with the hauler itself to take it to our landfill. Uh, what items are presently acceptable? Uh, we're looking at white goods primarily when you're talking about refrigerators, your, your toasters, things that people have a tendency of not disposing that sits in their garage for years. It just gives them an opportunity to go to the actual amnesty location and drop that off. We're also looking at furniture. Um, there will probably be some other items, but the only thing we probably will not take as of this time will be like paints and chemicals, things that would need additional type of disposal. Uh, I know that the Water Authority actually, they take care of one of those days, so we'll try to encourage our citizens to partake of the Water Authority's day when they're looking at paints and chemicals. Um, the staffing could consist of off-duty personnel to volunteer for overtime as to not impact the normal hours, but we're figuring out ways to stagger our code enforcement officers that particular day so we can ensure that we have it covered. And then, of course, we're going through the process to determine the best locations and the times for which we would conduct these respective um, amnesty days. The one thing I did not allude to, um, those two dates that I, um, those two weekends I outlined, we're looking at um, having locations at two of the districts on the 11th and 12th, and the other two districts that are not caught on the 11th and 12th, we will then uh, pivot to those, that, that two district, those two districts on the 18th and 19th. Um, operational questions right now, we're trying to determine the number of dumpsters that will be uh, uh, appropriate for the event. Um, our discussions have looked at like a 30-yard dumpster that um, I think Mr. Matarco said that's anywhere that can hold up about 50 times. Uh, we're certainly mindful of what we're going to our landfill, so we want to be able to control specifically the tonnage that will be taken in on those two weekends. Uh, we can expand the program if, if the board looks to allocate additional funding. So say, for instance, we wanted to have more than two 30-yard um, dumpsters at each location, we wanted to do four, then ultimately we got to make sure that there's costs or there's an ability to absorb that expense within the respective budgets that we have out there now. Um, we talked about determining impact on the landfill, and then, of course, the content needs to be sorted prior to going into the landfill. The next steps is, again, to confirm the dates and times. Uh, we confirm it a vendor hopefully by um, the week of the end of this week, if not the beginning of next week. We're looking to put something on the agenda for the board to ratify on the 15th board meeting. And then, of course, after the ratification of the board, we'll have some communication um, sent out to the citizens about the details of the event. So, therefore, we're properly marketing the event prior to the 11th and the 12th and the 18th and the 19th. So, with that, I will yield for any questions you may have. All right. Thank you. And Kevin, good. My question to you, and simply, well, I believe it was somewhat answered anyway uh, by the volunteers. It's staffing levels. Uh, wh how? Are, what's your staffing levels now? Um, and I know we're talking about in March, but it's always been a concern with the COVID, as well as your other duties and responsibilities. Yes, so, well, we actually have a team that works on Saturday anyway, sir. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. already allocated um every weekend saturday we have uh anywhere from three to five employees working and on sundays they're off um, so they would have to come sunday. in for overtime i think the 11th and the 12th 11th and 12th friday and friday, saturday. friday and saturday. saturday okay thank you for yes, that sir. all right i just want to make sure that because mm -hmm. this is a, a great uh initiative but we got to make sure that it is properly staffed yes sir. so that was only my concern as mm -hmm. to if if you didn't have the proper staff, and then we would have to get it somewhere else. Yes, so, sir. I already um, got that figured out how we can work the uh, continue with the community service. And depending on how many we have, I planned on having some of them also at the site to help with loading and um, unloading some of the materials into the um, roll off dumpsters. Okay, great. Questions? Yes. Commissioner mm -hmm. How many sites will, will you have? Um, um, on each date what was two locations two, two locations one in each district i'm on 11th and the 12th police talking to mike so i'm sorry yeah. sorry about that sir um two dumpsters one in each district and then the following weekend it'll be one dumpster in each district okay or, what if i decide i'm in district two but i decide the first week is going to be district four three and four um, will I be allowed to go down to three and four? 
Y yes, ma'am. Uh, think all we're really checking for is that you're a county resident. Okay. That's the main thing that we're looking for, but we won't try to delineate between the districts. The other thing we're looking to do, um, Captain Gooden and, and Captain McDonald were tasked with looking at our high volume dump areas. Mm -hmm. So we will try to put the, the, the dumpsters in locations that we feel like there's been a high volume of dumping within the community. And so that's the reason why we were unable to bring you the locations tonight. Mm -hmm. But we are looking at areas that we feel like there seems to be a high volume of dumping to ensure that that location is in close proximity to that respective neighborhood. Will there be a limit per citizen as to how much you can bring and how much you can dump? And I'm asking because Riverdale had a big problem with that and, and all, and it was an eyesore for weeks before they could get that area cleaned up. Well, some of the locations that I was looking into, um, pretty much I was trying to get it someplace where it's a county facility and it's also the citizens are less likely like uh one location i was looking into was um out at precinct one in district one um it's by the precinct it's also easy for you to control the traffic coming in and out mm -hmm. and then after we shut off um it's right next to the police station so people are less likely to continue with the dumping mm -hmm. so that's also when i'm trying to determine the sites i'm also looking into um, locations where it's high visibility and also um there's some type of security there i.e you know um close to a police precinct great job <laughs> commissioner expand upon your question about capacity um so one of the reasons why we're looking at um what size dumpsters should we get? We know that it will have a maximum tonnage on those respective dumpsters. So what we're, what we're projecting is that we should get a sense of what has been the usage and what has been the tonnage that's been going to the, the landfill to help us assess what size dumpsters that we need to have in place. But worst case scenario, once we reach that, if it's 50 tons, then we won't take any additional debris. Uh, we, do, we did recognize that we need to have somebody to monitor the space if we go from a Friday to Saturday so we don't have the illegal dumping while the site is not open. So we're planning for that too to make sure that's not a problem. But another recommendation that was made of the committee I thought was a good one is that on these particular days maybe we waive the fees at the landfill and those that want to go to the landfill without having to pay the tipping fees on those respective days, if this board agree to it, mm -hmm. they can go directly to the landfill and drop off their respective debris opposed even coming to the amnesty day. So it gives them some alternatives. So point in case they get there and it's a capacity and the landfill is still open, then they can go directly to the landfill and drop it off without any fees being assessed. That's good. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you all um, for for coming up with a great presentation. We do have plans. I want I want the public to know that. And when we do uh, orchestrate our plans, we take our time. We just don't put it out there. So for people who are talking about, you know, um, you all don't have a plan, we do have a plan, and we take it in. We want we take it in consideration. And um, you guys did an excellent job with this um, tonight. Um, the reason why I came up with this was because again. Um, in my area on Grant Road, there was, um, as I walked down the road uh, and I was out there with refuse control and the prisoners, there was enough trash out there that I could fill up my house and Mr. Dietrich's house and everybody else's house in, the, in, in, in here today. So we've got to, you know, if we want businesses to come to our community, we've got to start keeping it clean and cleaning it up because no one's going to come to a dirty community. Sure. So, again, thank you all for your presentation. It was very well done, and I appreciate you all, and I appreciate everything that you all do, Captain. Thank Definitely. you. Thank, thank you, you Captain. Um, one thing I would ask is that we don't call it an event but call it an initiative. initiative. I know that may be small. But it is huge because an initiative means we're doing something that's going to be ongoing and continuous. So, but you do an awesome job. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Captain. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stanford. If there's no other questions, then we will stand adjourned.